Good afternoon. The first item of business today is consideration of business motion 12423 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Bureau setting out a timetable for the Island Scotland Bill at stage three. If anyone objects to this, please say so now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion 12423. Formally moved. Thank you. No one objects, so the question therefore is that motion 12423 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. So we turn now to stage three proceedings on the Island's Scotland Bill. And in dealing with the amendment, members should have with them the bill as amended at stage two, that is SP Bill 15A, the marshalled list and supplement to the marshalled list, and the groupings. The division bell will sound and proceedings will be suspended for five minutes following the first division, or sorry, for the first division of the afternoon. The period of voting for the first division will be 30 seconds. Thereafter, there will be one minute for every division. And members who wish to speak in the debate on any group of amendments should press their request to seat button as soon as possible after I call the group. So we turn now to the marshalled list. And I call Amendment 1 in the name of Lee MacArthur, grouped with Amendment 6. Lee MacArthur to move Amendment 1 and speak to both amendments in the group. Uh, thank you very much indeed, President Officer. It's a pleasure to get Stage 3 of the Islands Bill uh, underway. It does feel slightly counterintuitive to start by focusing on uninhabited islands rather than islands uh, that sustain populations and communities. Nevertheless, as the committee acknowledged at Stage 2 in supporting my original amendment, the importance of uninhabited islands should never be underestimated. Uh, as I said at stage two, while fewer of twen 20 of Orkney's islands are inhabited, all 70 or so uh, play a crucial role in making Orkney the unique place it is, not least in sustaining populations of birds that are not just of national, but of global uh, significance. In their briefing, as well as drawing attention to the fact that uninhabited islands uh, can be a refuge for some of Scotland's most at-risk or sensitive species, RSPB point to the fact that islands such as St Kilda uh, can also be of considerable cultural significance as well. The committee agreed, uh, taking the step at stage two, uh, of reflecting what it saw as, quote, the cultural, environmental and economic significance of uninhabited islands and putting this on the face of the bill. Nevertheless, I think it was accepted by uh, everyone that uh, we needed to ensure the changes properly reflected our collective intent. My amendment uh, one seeks to achieve that, making more explicit the link between uninhabited islands and the inhabited islands to which they make such a significant contribution. Uh, I'm very grateful to the Minister and his officials uh, for their help in this tidying up exercise. I would also like to thank RSPB and uh, committee members, particularly John Mason, uh, who brought forward very similar amendments at uh, stage two for their support to date. And I hope Parliament will follow uh, suit now. And I move amendment one in my name. Thank you. I call Colin Smith. Oh, sorry, I beg your pardon. Call the Minister first. Beg your pardon. Minister Hamza Youssef. Uh, thank you, uh, Planning Officer. Delighted to get this debate, uh, stage three debate, underway on behalf of the Government and, of course, at a point of consensus. I'd like to thank uh, Liam MacArthur, MacArthur for bringing forward Amendment 1. I indicated at stage two that the Government agreed with his original amendment to bring uninhabited islands into the bill. I also indicated that we had a technical concern about the wording and the way it fitted into section two. It read as if an island community could be an uninhabited island on its own. I'm pleased that the member has worked with us to produce amendment one. The proposed amendment makes it clearer that uninhabited islands fit within the common interest, identity, or geography of the people on islands, rather than the uninhabited islands constituting a community as of itself. So I'm very happy uh, to support amendment uh, one. In terms of amendment six, it's a technical amendment. Uh, section 2A of the bill was introduced into the bill at stage two as an amendment uh, 29 by Colin Smith, MSP. It provides a definition of islands authority and the list of key definitions. The definition was intended to be used for the purposes of amendments that were not agreed to by the committee and the term islands authority is therefore not used in the bill as amended at stage two. Uh, such the definition of that term in the bill as it stands is redundant and serves no legal purpose. The local authorities covered by it are already listed in the schedule. Therefore, this amendment simply removes Section 2A from the bill as amended at Stage 2. Thank you. And this time I do call Colin Smith. <clears throat> Thank you, President Officer. Uh, as the Minister says, Amendment 6 uh, removes the definition of the term island authority added at Stage 2 of the bill as a result <coughs> of Amendment 
by myself at the time. This was a <coughs> consequential amendment to two other amendments proposed by myself at stage two that were ultimately not passed and accordingly it's now no longer necessary. I have tabled amendments at stage three similar to those two I refer to that were not passed at stage two but I have chosen not to use the phrase island authority therefore there is no longer a requirement for this phrase to be within the bill. I am therefore content with amendment six to, to remove um, that definition. I also support Amendment 1 in the name of Liam MacArthur, which, aims, uh, which amends the current provision covering the fact that uninhabited islands can be considered island communities. In doing so, it rightly recognises their natural, cultural and economic value and has Labour's full support. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I would ask Liam MacArthur if he, if he could wind up and to press or withdraw Amendment 1. Just to say, President Officer, I thank Colin Smith and the Minister for their supportive comments. I, I think also helpful for the Minister and Colin Smith to set out the background to Amendment 6, which uh, we would be supporting as well as a technical amendment. But with that, I move Amendment 1. Thank you very much. And can I ask then, uh, the question is that Amendment 1 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 6 in the name of the Minister. Minister to move formally. Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 6 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And we turn to Group 2. Can I call Amendment 7 in the name of the Minister, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings, and the Minister to move Amendment 7 and speak to all the amendments in the group. I will speak uh, to Amendment uh, 7, which I move uh, in my name, and then the other amendments in the group. Uh, there has been a wide-ranging discussion throughout the bill process about the level of detail that should be included within the National Islands Plan. Uh, while I've expressed my wariness of putting too much uh, detail on specific points in the face of the bill, I have actually welcomed the debate and, and the very good discussion that we've had uh, on this issue, presiding officer. But I hold to my central premise on this. It would be unfair if Parliament presents to island communities uh, and indeed other stakeholders a, a pre-populated plan for them just to tinker around uh, the edges. We have to allow the process for developing and populating the plan uh, to be a, a meaningful one. Uh, that said, there's clearly an appetite for the plan to consider and cover particular issues, uh, and I've taken that on board. I welcome the positive discussions which I have had with members across the chamber on, the, on a series of amendments. Uh, starting with the amendment in my name, Amendment 7, it's a minor and technical amendment that restructures Section 3 to allow for more topics to be listed. Amendment 17 from John Mason includes environmental wellbeing as a topic to be included in the National Islands Plan, which I'm happy to support. Amendments 18, 19, 20 and 21 from Lee MacArthur include improving transport services, improving digital connectivity, reducing fuel poverty and ensuring effective management of the Scottish Crown Estate, uh, all as topics within the National Islands Plan and I'm happy to support those amendments also. Uh, Amendment 22 from John Finney includes enhancing biodiversity, including protecting islands from the impact of invasive non-native species as a topic in the National Islands Plan and I'm happy to also support that amendment. Amendment 23 from Jamie Green deals with an issue raised at stage two. Uh, Mr Green proposed that all the objectives in the National Islands Plan should be measurable. I, I did raise some concern during the debate that I think it's not possible to guarantee that every single objective potentially covered by this plan, especially high level objectives, uh, can realistically uh, be measured. So the proposed Amendment 23 put forward by uh, Jamie Green takes these concerns on board and places a duty on ministers to consider how to measure the improvements of outcomes, whether that's quantitatively or indeed uh, qualitatively, which I appreciate. So I think it's a good amendment, which requires ministers to consider the measurement of outcomes, but also allows for flexibility, where that may be difficult, so happy to support. Amendment 8 follows from an amendment that John Mason lodged at stage 2. He argued that while the bill sets out those who must be consulted about the National Island Plan, it missed a broader constituency of people who are not based on islands, but who have an interest in the islands, people I suppose like uh, himself and, and myself. The proposed amendment is straightforward and will help deliver his aim of including the wider public interest in the National Islands Plan. So I hope we can agree to all the amendments in this group. And of course, I move uh, Amendment 7 in my name. Thank you very much. And could I call John Mason to speak to Amendment 17 and the other amendments in this group? Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd particularly like to speak to Amendments 17 and 8, which are both in my name and both of which concern the National Islands Plan. Uh, firstly, Amendment 17. The focus of this bill is rightly on island communities. Therefore, in Section 3, Subsection 3, the bill focuses on improving and promoting sustainable economic development, health and well-being and community empowerment. All of these are absolutely fine. 
However, there are more to islands than people, and I think uh, we already had the uh, First Amendment about uninhabited islands, which is why the RSPB and I were keen to have a specific mention of the natural heritage of Scotland's islands on the face of the bill, which would mean this would be embedded in forthcoming and future island plans. Using the wording environmental well-being is more consistent with other legislation such as the Community Empowerment Act 2015 and the Scottish Crown Estate Bill 2018 as introduced. So I hope members will support this amendment, which would mean that the three pillars of sustainable development, economic, social and environmental interests, are all included in the face of the bill. Moving secondly to Amendment 8, at Stage 2, as the Minister said, I lodged an amendment to widen the range of those consulted on the island's plan to include a broader constituency of people who are not based on the islands, but who have an interest in the islands. The bill as it stands does not limit those who can respond to consultation, but rather provides that certain persons and groups must be consulted. My proposed Amendment 8 aims to include the wider public interest I see it as a positive move because there is a genuine commitment to our islands beyond those who normally live on them. Should the amendment be accepted, the relevant provision in the bill would read that the Scottish ministers must consult such persons as they consider likely to be affected by or have an interest in the proposals contained in the plan. Uh, I do hope that members will support both of these amendments. Thank you. Thank you. And could I call Liam MacArthur to speak to Amendment 18 and the other amendments in this group? Thank you, President Officer. I think it's fair to say the National Islands Plan has received fairly widespread support, but there's been a lively debate about um, what should be contained within that plan uh, and indeed the extent to which legislation uh, should try to set that out explicitly. And I appreciate there's a, a balance to be struck here. If the content of the plans is too rigidly uh, defined, it's unlikely to have uh, the flexibility to meet effectively uh, the different and changing needs of island communities now and into the future. Nevertheless, as I pointed out at stage two in speaking to amendments that I and Tavish Scott uh, lodged, there are key areas where I think it would be inconceivable for the plans to remain silent and where I think it would be helpful for those to be reflected uh, on the face of the bill. The examples we cited at that stage were ferry services, broadband, fuel poverty and Crown Estate powers. Others uh, refer to uh, other examples. And I'm grateful again to the Minister and his officials for uh, their willingness to uh, work with myself and with Tavish uh, Scott since stage two in coming forward with ways of achieving, I think, what are shared objectives. Amendment 18 reflects the fact that, crucially important though ferry services are to our island uh, communities, these are not the only lifeline transport links upon which our island communities depend. Similarly, Amendment 19 is an acknowledgement that more than high-speed broadband, the future uh, vitality and even viability of many of our island communities will be reliant upon and with apologies to my colleague Tavish Scott, who I know has an aversion to the uh, phrase digital connectivity uh, that keeps pace with technological advances. Uh, Amendment 20 puts on the face of the bill the importance of island plans also addressing the scourge of fuel poverty, which continues to affect a higher proportion of households in uh, rural and island areas than anywhere else. Uh, again, I thank the Minister and his colleague Kevin Stewart for meeting uh, with me last week to discuss uh, ongoing concerns. I and many uh, of those with a direct involvement in rural fuel poverty issues have that in redefining fuel poverty, the government risks ignoring the specific rural dimension to this problem. And I hope by the time the government publishes its fuel poverty bill, it will have addressed these concerns. Meantime, by including the reduction of fuel poverty in the National Islands Plan, I think we make that outcome more likely. Finally, another issue where uh, the substantive deba debate will take place in the context of other legislation revolves around the devolution of the Crown Estate's functions and responsibilities. Uh, the standalone bill will provide an opportunity for us to debate our respective positions and where the responsibilities are best exercised. And for the record, I believe uh, this should be at island authority level where there is a desire to do so. For now, Amendment 21 will ensure that the National Islands Plan reflects the importance of effective management of these assets uh, to our island uh, communities. This bill, through the Islands Plan, offers a chance to put in place firm commitments and safeguards to ensure the provision of services in our islands meets certain standards as a minimum and that our island communities are not constantly left as an afterthought. The amendments I've uh, outlined will hopefully go some way to helping ensure this happens. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I call John Finney to speak to Amendment 22 and the other amendments in the group. Um, thank you, uh, President Officer. Um, I, I hear what the Minister says about pre-populating a plan and would align myself with comments that Liam MacArthur's 
made uh, about uh, a general direction of travel and, and likewise would echo the, the positive engagement there's been with uh, the Minister and officials on this. I particularly want to talk about uh, the, the Scottish Green Party will be supporting all the amendments in this group and I think they enhance uh, what's already a good piece of legislation. I particularly want to talk about Amendment 22, which is enhancing biosecurity, including protecting islands from the impact of invasive non-species. Now, it's already been said in this debate that there are internationally important populations of breeding birds and they are, uh, in Scotland. They are concentrated on the islands. And, of course, they're vulnerable to predation um, from ground-based predators like rats, rats, mice and stoats. And th these mammals are not native to the islands. And when people introduce these either deliberately or by accident, it can have significant effects because these species are unable to breed at the same rate as they're predated upon. So um, it is a global asset. That phrase was used and it's imperative that we protect our, our, our seabird uh, breeding islands from invasive species. And by implementing a biosecurity and early warning rapid response capacity. Um, uh, indeed. Stuart Stevenson. Um, would, it, would, it be, would it be helpful if the member uh, indicated that when he and his amendment used the phrase invasive non-native non species, he is referring to each individual island's previous ecostructure rather than something that merely is in Scotland as a non-invasive species. John Finney. Uh, thank you. Yes, I, I'm grateful for the member for his question. Yes, of course, each island is different in its own rights and there are different threats that are posed. There are indigenous species in some that aren't in others. Um, but uh, these, these uh, colonies are facing uh, climate change-driven impacts, and they've had massive impact, particularly in Shetland and Orkney, um, and uh, that's been linked primarily to the, the falling populations of the nutritious prey fish, especially sand eels, and these declines in turn are linked to warming seas. So we must maximise resilience of Scotland's seabird population, and people will be aware there's been a rolling programme of um, island restoration, including Elsa Craig, Canna, and more recently the Shants, um, and these are examples where rodent eradication has taken place. But this uh, ambition will be pointless without solid biosecurity arrangements for our islands. And this, and protecting currently uninvaded islands, is where the current amendment comes in. Now, in July 2017, the world's island invasive conference was actually held in Dundee. This was, event only happens every six or seven years. And it was in Dundee because the world's leading uh, um, rodent eradication pro project, which was in South Georgia, it was now, and now officially declared a success, was led by a team based at Dundee University. So together with the success of past projects and the challenges of the currently unfolding issues, such as Orkney Stoats, we are well placed to develop a timely and groundbreaking public policy in this regard. And I hope members will lend their support to my, and indeed all the other amendments in this group. Thank you. Thank you. And can I call Jamie Green to speak to Amendment 23 and the other amendments in the group? Thank you, Presiding Officer. I would like to speak to some of the amendments in this group. Uh, I'll start with my own. That's Amendment 23. Uh, I think, as the Minister just outlined, we came to this place uh, from Stage 2, where I felt, as part of a uh, Stage 1 committee recommendation, uh, which stated that the committee recommends that the plan be developed with clear outcomes, targets, and measurable indicators by which... Uh, to establish performance. And I think that's quite an important part of this. The plan itself should be something which we can hold the government of the day to account with. Uh, by doing so, I think the introduction of specific, specific measurable objectives where possible are helpful. I appreciate we've come some way in the language of this amendment, and I do thank the minister and his bill team for, for, for uh, an element of compromise in that, and I, I'm pleased that we will have support on the introduction of that concept. Um, just looking to some of the other amendments uh, in this group, um, whilst that, uh, it's fair to say that we're broadly supportive of, of, of most of them, um, I think the problem here is that we're doing at stage three what we said we wouldn't do, and that's we suddenly started to create lists of items that are put on the face of the bill into primary legislation that we said and agreed that we would put and hope to see in the National Islands Plan. Now, if you look at what the committee agreed, uh, we said that there were, whilst a large number numbers of, of policy areas that affected Ireland specifically, there were also a number of key priority areas. And they did include transport and digital connectivity uh, and a number of items. Uh, so whilst it's pleasing to see members bring those uh, elements in, it's also slightly disappointing that we get to stage three where uh, it, it's difficult to say no to some of these uh, concepts because they are indeed things that we should uh, be thinking about in terms of outcomes for Ireland's. But I'm also slightly disappointed that we're at this stage 
uh, starting to create exhaustive lists that doesn't, for example, cl include access to education or access to health and social care or housing or workforce and employment opportunities and some of the other things that the committee identified as being equally key uh, important um, measures that should be in the plan. So we've, we've created a very small list of things that, the, that there must be... Uh, in a second. We've created a very small list of things that must be in the, uh, in, in the uh, islands plan, but we, we've also left it open to things that maybe should be in it that currently aren't. And that is my only concern about, about the, the, the addition of, of some of these. Happy to give way to Mr. Mason. John Mason. For giving way. I mean, I, I take his point that we shouldn't have too much detail, but would he accept that these are all fairly high level uh, additions that are being put in at this point? And they're certainly not exclusive, but they're, but they're not going into a huge amount of detail. Jamie Green. No, they're not going into a amount of detail. Um, they are high level, um, but it is only two or three issues. Um, uh, are we saying, therefore, that these issues are more important than some of the other uh, high priority areas that the committee uh, discussed? Um, and I'd, I'd hate to think, uh, in a second, I'd hate to think that uh, digital connectivity, transport, um, and uh, the other one being um, uh, around uh, reducing fuel poverty in the Crown Estate are the only issues which are of importance to us as a parliament. Happy to give way again. John Finney. Thank you. I'm grateful for the member giving way. Whilst recognising what he says, would he acknowledge that there was an opportunity, had he sought to, to have put amendments into that effect himself? Jamie Green. I, I do beg your pardon. I actually couldn't hear the member properly in that. Would, you mind would John Finney you? repeat himself, please? Uh, yeah. I'm grateful for the member taking the intervention. Um, and I acknowledge what he says about the list there, but would he acknowledge that given the time frame there is for this legislation, that had he thought these issues that he, he listed himself were important, he could have put amendments into that effect? Yeah. Jamie Green. Yes, we could have, but um, I, I get the impression that at both at stage one and stage two, the committee, the committee collectively thought the right thing to do was not start creating lists for the very reason, otherwise we wouldn't be having the discussion. So yes, we could have added things in, but we could have ended up with a very long list of things that we think the Islands Plan should contain. Nonetheless, I hope that when uh, the Minister produces the Islands Plan, those things will be in there non nonetheless. So for that reason, we, we will support them. Uh, I also will support Mr Finney's amendment uh, around the issue of enhancing biosecurity on islands. I think that's an important uh, addition. And, and again, there's, there's very little to disagree with. Um, the only two amendments which we... Uh, perhaps uh, we're, we're less in favour of uh, the first one being um, John Mason's amendment around environmental well-being. Um, I, I, and I'm, I'm welcome uh, to, uh, to the, the member for, for uh, explaining it a, li a little bit more detail, but the, the term environmental well-being, uh, I think, is quite unclear uh, and a little bit vague in, the, in this respect. What does the member mean by environmental well-being, uh, to put it to, to, to put it on the face of this bill in that respect. So, um, again, I, I think it's entirely unclear. Uh, yes, I think it's, uh, if he could help us with that, that would be much appreciated. John Mason. Uh, I thank the member for giving way again. I mean, the original wording was natural heritage, and, and that was what RSPB and, and myself and the, and the government were comfortable with. I think, though, to get consistency with other legislation, the, the preference was for environmental well-being. But I think the two phrases are really meant to mean the same thing. Jamie Green. Okay, um, I appreciate, I don't think they are the same thing. I still think environmental well-being is uh, a, a very non-specific phrase, which uh, to me doesn't have uh, a huge amount of meaning on, on the face of the legislation. So um, the other amendment is one that I think we had a lot of chat around uh, in terms of uh, the uh, duty to consult on production of the plan, and that's Amendment 8, uh, again from John Mason, uh, that states uh, that uh, anyone who has an interest in islands, it must be consulted uh, in the production of the plan. The problem with that, and I think what I would hope is not a consequence of this, is that any stakeholder with any interest um, would uh, somehow get involved in the process, and this would detract from the fact that as islanders themselves who should be at the heart of consultation and the preparation of the plan. I think the, the phrase, or have an interest in, opens it up uh, far too much to any stakeholder anywhere in the country who, who, who has a, a vested interest in any matter uh, that the plan may address. And for that reason, I, I, I think we're unable to support uh, Amendment uh, 8. Uh, thank you very much for saying also. Thank you. And I'd call Colin Smith to be followed by Edward Mountain. Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome Amendment 7 in the name of, of Hamza Youssef, which ensures that, that the reference to increasing population remains 
on the face of the bill. At stage two, I propose an amendment to the bill to ensure that this was included in the aims of the National Island Plan. And I'm pleased to see the Minister recognising the importance of this and his amendment by retaining that reference, uh, albeit worded slightly differently. Depopulation is one of the key challenges facing island communities, and it's absolutely essential that the National Islands Plan sets out proposals to try to tackle this challenge. Explicitly stating this in the bill is an effective way to ensure that this remains a priority, not just now, but also in the future. I'm also pleased to support the amendments 17 to 22 from John Mason, Liam MacArthur and John Finney, which all provide more detail and a statutory underpinning to the aims of the National Islands Plan. I support the principle of outlining the aims of that plan in the bill as a means of ensuring that the ambition and aims of the plan are not watered down over time. The issues referenced in amendments 17 to 22 are critically important to island communities and should be included. Amendment 23 by Jamie Green creates, a, I think, a reasonable and useful requirement for ministers to outline how they will measure the extent to which the aims of the plan are realised. This makes that a valuable addition to the bin, the bill, and I'm happy to support it. Finally, I'm also happy to support Amendment 8 by John Mason, which broadens who should be consulted in the preparation of that National Islands Plan to include those with an interest in the relevant proposals. This is a logical amendment and serves to strengthen the consultation process and hopefully in doing so, the final plan. Thank you. Thank you. And I call on Edward Mountain. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I want to talk specifically about Amendment 17. I listened carefully to what John Mason just said about the definition of environmental well-being. The term still seems very vague to me and opens up itself to all sorts of interpretation. Uh, Presiding Officer, if, if Mr Mason would be any clearer in his definition to, rather than say it means I think the same as something else, I'd be delighted to hear it now because it may be able to sway us. And I would be prepared to give way to Mr Mason if he'd prepare to defend it. John Mason. Um, I, th I thank the member for giving way. I'm not sure, oh, sorry for taking my intervention, I'm not sure um, I can really say an awful lot more than I have said already. As I said, our first choice was natural heritage. It is our intention that it means the same as natural heritage, but we were seeking to give consistency with other legislation because it does seem if we're using these terms in a variety of legislation, it's better to use the same terms and they seem to have been accepted in other legislation. Edward Mountain. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I, I thank Mr Mason for trying to explain that. For, for me, the problem is, is that environmental well-being will mean different things to different people and different environments, where the well-being of one environment may be improved, the well-being of a different environment may not. I, I come to this chamber, Presiding Officer, with 15 years' experience as a land manager and with a degree in land management. I have never come across this expert... Sorry, Presiding Officer. Uh, I, I've never come across this term before or this definition, which to me seems unquantifiable. And therefore, because I believe good legislation requires tight definitions, which are explainable and definable, I believe it's impossible for myself and I believe the Conservatives, the Scottish Conservatives, to vote for this amendment. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. I call Mike Rumbles. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. Just a short point I'd like some clarification on in the interest of good legislation and, and good government. I want, want to make sure we get this right in, in stage three. So some indication perhaps from the Minister on John Mason's amendment number eight. Um, I hear what Jamie Green has been saying, that does this throw it too wide an area for, uh, for interest um, away from the islanders, or is the government content with this? as good legislation. Uh, I'd be genuinely interested to see because it would be very helpful. Thank you. And I call on the Minister to wind up in this section. Well, once again, this has been a, it's a good and informative debate around the content of, of the plan. I would try to give some reassurance to, to Jamie because I think he's absolutely right. There has to be a balance between not producing an exhaustive list. And in some respects, it could be argued that we're starting to fall down that trap. But I think where, where we have some safeguards, where we have some of those checks and balances, is what we're discussing here are generally very high level uh, of objectives. What I would say is a couple of points. One is the list is not exhaustive, but also the important part is section, uh, two, uh, sorry, section four uh, in the bill around preparation and scrutiny of the plan. And within that, of course, that uh, island communities uh, will be very much a part of that engagement process uh, when we come to develop the National Islands Plan. Yes, of course, others may have an input. 
so those that don't live in islands, uh, those that uh, perhaps represent uh, the mainland. But realistically speaking, pragmatically and practically speaking, there'll be no doubt at all in anybody's mind here that we will be, of course, even travelling to many island communities, hearing from them direct around their uh, needs, their interests around what's us in the National Islands Plan. So I think the point is well made. It's on the record there that you know, there's no need for an exhaustive list, but we have here a general direction of travel about issues and high-level issues that are of importance. In terms of, 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 of uh, John Mason's uh, amendment, yes, we will be supporting it. I, I think, um, again, it falls into that category of high-level objectives. I think we would be uh, splitting hairs if uh, you cannot accept that environmental well-being uh, has an overarching high-level uh, objective. I think it very much uh, is uh, that. So we will be supporting uh, John Mason's uh, amendment and indeed all the amendments uh, very much uh, in this group. So I I'm pleased that we've achieved a degree of uh, consensus and agreement on the plan. Uh, of course, I ask you to support the amendments in my name and hopefully the other amendments in the group also. Thank you very much. We turn now to uh, the vote, and the first question is that Amendment 7 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 17 already debated in the name of John Mason. John Mason to move or not move? Moved. Moved. The question is that Amendment 17 be agreed to. Are we agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We're going to move to a vote, but this is the first division of the stage, so we'll have a short suspension of five minutes while I call members to the chamber. So a short suspension for five minutes.
Thank you. We resume uh, proceedings. And the question is that Amendment 17 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote, and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on Amendment Number 17 in the name of John Mason, yes, 94, no, 28. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. And I call Amendment 18 in the name of Lee MacArthur, already debated. Lee MacArthur to move or not move? Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 18 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. <coughs> we are agreed. I call Amendment 19 in the name of Lee MacArthur. Already debated. Lee MacArthur to move or not move? Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 19 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 20 in the name of Lee MacArthur. Lee MacArthur to move? Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 20 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. I call Amendment 21 in the name of Lee MacArthur. Lee MacArthur to move? Moved. Moved. The question is that Amendment 21 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 22 in the name of John Finney, already debated. John Finney to move or not move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 22 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 23 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated. Jamie Green to move or not move. Moved. Moved, thank you. The question is that Amendment 23 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. I call Amendment 8 in the name of John Mason, already debated. John Mason to move or not move. Moved. That's moved. The question is that Amendment 8 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division on Amendment 8. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on Amendment 8 in the name of John Mason is yes, 89, no, 34. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. And that concludes the, group, sorry, the, the votes in that group. We turn now to group number three. And I call Amendment 24 in the name of Peter Chapman, group with amendments as shown in the groupings. Peter Chapman to move Amendment 24 and speak to all amendments in the group. Peter. I thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I would like to move Amendment 24 and speak to, to all the other members in this group, including 25, which is also in my name. Amendment 24 introduces the aspect of retrospective island impact assessment into the bill. And now this concept was widely supported at stage one across all parties, but wasn't supported at stage two. And this simple amendment in my name would seek to change the current wording of the bill to ensure that a relevant authority must prepare an island community's impact assessment in relation to a policy, strategy or service, which in their opinion has had an effect that is, that is significantly different from its effect on other communities. Now it is clear that the Scottish Government and members of the REC Committee support the concept of island proofing. And this amendment would enable local island authorities to submit an assessment to the Scottish Government on any previous legislation that has significantly hindered them as an island community. Now it was argued at stage two that this simple amendment could create an over-bureaucratic exercise for local island authorities and open the door too widely to change. But this amendment is clear in that it would op operate the same way as future island impact assessments 
and would only if the authority feels a policy, service or strategy has significantly impacted them would they have to prepare an assessment. Now I appreciate that the Minister for Transport and Islands has verbally committed to reviewing any past legislation and, and that, that has had a significant impact on an island community. So if the relevant authority brings it to his attention and with that commitment, I think it is appropriate that this be acknowledged in the bill. Now moving on to Amendment 25, also in my name, it, that is, it is subsequent to Amendment 24. It also copies the wording from 8.1 as a technical change to ensure that relevant authorities do not have to publish explanations for not carrying out island communities' impact assessments unless the policy, strategy or service has had an, an effect which is significantly different from its effect on other communities. Now, moving on, we support Amendment 10 in the name of the Minister, Humza, Yusuf, which is a technical amendment that ensures relevant authorities can effectively comply with the Section 7 duty to have regard to island communities and therefore produce island community impact assessments as set out in Section 8. We also support Amendment 12 in the name of Liam MacArthur, uh, and Amendment 28 in the name of Colin Smith. Now, these amendments also relate to retrospective island communities' impact assessments, but are much more prescriptive than my amendment. Amendment 12 sets out a schedule for Scottish ministers to respond to requests from relevant authorities and also places a duty to publish retrospective island communities' impact assessments on Scottish ministers. This would be particularly useful for the authorities that do not have the time to carry out their own assessments now, Amendment 28 also ensures that new regulations set out by ministers must be laid before the Parliament and that each local authority in the schedule and any, any other relevant person must be consulted. Both of these amendments add a further scrutiny to Scottish ministers' role in the process, which is important to ensure the Scottish Government commitment is met. And Amendment 33 in this group is subsequent to Amendment 28 and we will therefore support it also. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you. And I call on the Minister to speak to Amendment 10 and the other amendments in this group. Thank you, <coughs> President Officer. Amendment 24, lodged by Peter Chapman, is a repeat of the amendment the member brought forward at stage two. I'm afraid I still can't support it. I reiterate a lot of what I said at stage two as it still remains relevant here. The amendment would, it would uh, seem to require all the relevant authorities to review all previous policies, services or strategies which I believe, which it believes may have had a significant different impact on island communities from their effect on other communities. Uh, as there's no criteria or indeed thresholds for the retrospective element, the amendments have no time limit on how far back the relevant authority we need to go. Would it have to go back years? Would it have to go back decades? I asked this question at stage two and the answer still seems to be that it would be mandatory for an authority to review and potentially prepare an impact assessment for every policy, strategy or service they have ever developed, de delivered or indeed redeveloped. Uh, that is neither practical uh, nor indeed reasonable. Uh, it could also take a significant amount of resource to undertake these reviews that could be deployed elsewhere. Amendment 25 also from Peter Chapman seems to require that when a relevant authority does not prepare an island's community impact assessment for a policy, strategy or service, which is likely to have or have had a significant different effect on an island community, then it must publish its reasons for not doing so. Uh, under Section 8, uh, one, if there is a significantly different effect on an island community, then the relevant authority is under a duty to prepare an island community's impact assessment. It has no choice. There would be no question of the authority publishing reasons for not undertaking such an assessment, because in these circumstances, it would have done the assessment. I hope that this reassures Mr Chapman that there's adequate provision already in the bill to achieve broadly the same purpose of his amendment and that he will not press it. If he does press it, I, if he does press it, I cannot support a measure which duplicates process and requires an extensive burden on the resource of affected relevant authorities. I give way to Jamie Green. Jamie Green. I thank the Minister for taking my intervention. Uh, the, the, I, th I think the, the Minister is saying that this amendment will mean that all historic uh, legislation uh, must be looked at uh, in terms of its, uh, inf uh, its effect on islands. But the key phrase in, in the bill is in the authority's opinion. So there's still an element of subjectivity there in terms of which legislation, historic legislation, they will have to look at. So it's not the case 
that all pieces of legislation will have to be looked at. There's still the safeguard of, in the authority's opinion, in the amendment and also in the bill as it currently stands. Minister. Well, I accept uh, Jamie Green's point. That could, in one sense, make it redundant. And what is the purpose of Peter Chapman as if the power rests with the uh, authority to determine whether to do it or whether not to do it? Uh, and the point being is also that uh, I'm going to come on to a couple of the other amendments which I think uh, tackle this issue uh, ever so uh, slightly uh, better. So if I take uh, a couple of the other amendments uh, in this uh, group setting off, so Mr uh, Con Smith's amendment uh, 28 would require ministers to develop regulations to set up a scheme to allow Ireland local authorities to make a request to amend legislation. I know from past experience you can have one island authority that has indicated as having difficulty with the requirements of a particular piece of legislation. It's keen to see it changed. Uh, but indeed other island authorities have no issues with the same legislation. And the problem might be a more local issue regarding the implementation rather than, for example, a problem with the legislation itself. So I feel that if introduced Amendment 28 could become the default starting position for island authorities. If they don't like a particular piece of legislation rather than engaging proactively to seek resolution uh, through other means. So I would also argue that Colin Smith's amendment seems to ignore the fact that we're creating island proofing for legislation in this bill. It creates his amendment a future where no matter that the legislation has been through island proofing processes set out in the bill, then a local authority can still put in a request and essentially relitigate the whole process uh, again, and uh, it can do this at any time. Uh, regarding uh, Amendment 12 from Lee MacArthur, I think that a number of the issues that are similar to those I've outlined in Colin Smith's Amendment 28 also apply here, but it does have the benefit of creating a simple uh, and straightforward process which focuses on requests for island community impact assessments rather than leaping to the need for legislative change. So I do understand the point that is being made. I've been listening and trying to work out what we can do flexibly and proportionately to respond to members' concerns and to address those concerns, I've lodged Amendment 10. Uh, this is based <clears throat> on an amendment by Colin Smith at Stage 2, and I'm grateful for his input. The amendment will put in place, <coughs> excuse me, plain officer, the amendment will put in place a requirement to have an ongoing, flexible and proportionate review process, which would have the same effect as a retrospective assessment process. Uh, indeed, I would suggest it supports better governance all round government and public authorities and agencies should keep policies and legislation under review. We should want to be testing how things work in practice continuously and make necessary adjustments or changes as needed. So my amendment would ensure that there's a, a continuing need to reflect on current policies and strategies and undertake island communities impact assessments when required in a flexible and proportionate way. In order to give even further reassurance uh, to members, I, I agree that it would be useful to determine if there is existing legislation passed by this Parliament that needs addressed in terms of islands' interests and needs. And my offer to island authorities has always been that they have an open door with me to come forward with any proposals of legislation that they feel needs re-examined. What I can give a further undertaking to the Chamber is that I will continue to work with Cabinet Secretaries uh, and indeed fellow Ministers to proactively trawl their portfolio interests for recent legislation, policy strategies, and indeed plans to review the impact on islands. Uh, that action would have the impact and effect that is being sought to achieve without the need for legislation. I hope that members will support Amendment 10 in my name. I urge Mr Chapman to withdraw uh, Amendment 24, not move uh, Amendment uh, 25. I would urge uh, Colin Smith not to move Amendment 28 and 33, as they would lead to the many problems I have outlined. I'd ask Lee MacArthur not to move Amendment 12, but if he does, uh, I will be happy to support that amendment. Thank you. And I call Liam MacArthur to speak to Amendment 12 and the other amendments in this group. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. The centrepiece of this bill is its promise uh, for so-called island proofing, a commitment that policy and legislation in future will be tailored to reflect the needs and circumstances of island communities and move away from a damaging one-size-fits-all approach to governing. Uh, this is welcome, of course, but it cannot be the extent of our ambition. Um, for years, I've highlighted examples of where decisions by government and its agencies have failed to take proper account of the island dimension. For island proofing to be properly effective in meeting the needs of our island communities, we need to be able to look back as well as forward. This can't, I accept, be wholly open-ended. My amendment at stage two, unfortunately, risked opening up the prospect of legislation down through the ages uh, being subject to some kind of island proofing MOT. Uh, government uh, at neither national nor local level has the time, resources or the appetite to get bogged down in a never-ending review of every piece of legislation on the statute book. Uh, 
So, having listened to the Minister's concerns at stage two, I believe my Amendment 12 now offers a proportionate means of enabling island proofing to take place retrospectively. Island authorities would be the route through which an application for review of existing legislation or strategies uh, would be made to ministers. They, in turn, would then have three months in which to confirm or refuse any request, giving reasons in the case of the latter. Where a, re a request is granted, ministers would then have six months in which to prepare a retrospective island communities impact assessment. These are reasonable timescales and a proportionate response to the case made by all three islands councils, the committee and many others uh, for island proofing to be extended to existing legislation, policy and strategies. I acknowledge and welcome the steps taken by Peter Chapman and, and Colin Smith to address the same issue, uh, though the hope that they and their colleagues uh, might agree to support my amendment to take forward our common objective. Presiding officer, previously I've given examples of regulations governing issues as wide-ranging as building standards to home care provision that, in an Orkney contest, uh, risk achieving the absolute opposite of the laudable intentions behind them. That's in no one's interest, least of all our island communities. This bill must prevent such situations arising in future, but Amendment 12 allows us an opportunity uh, to right at least some of the wrongs that already exist. And I'm grateful uh, to the Minister for uh, the indication of his support, albeit caveated, uh, but also Colin Smith for the collaborative approach he's taken to this uh, amendment. Look forward to voting on it later. Thank you. Thank you, and I call Colin Smith to speak to Amendment 28 and the other amendments in this group. Thank you, President Officer. Amendment 28, in my name, would require ministers to establish a scheme for requests by local authorities to improve or mitigate the effect of existing legislation. This amendment is entirely in keeping with the aims of this bill. The introduction of island impact assessments recognises the unique nature of the islands and the need to ensure that protections are in place against any unintended negative consequences of legislation. To limit this solely to new legislation when the impact of existing laws could be detrimental to our island communities would not capture the spirit of the bill. I believe that my amendment complements the amendment from Liam MacArthur on respective <coughs> impact assessments. There is a, a need for a, a general retrospective impact assessment mechanism and I fully support Liam MacArthur's amendment to this effect. What my amendment seeks to do is slightly different and, and indeed may help reduce the administrative burden of retrospective impact assessments. In instances where a specific problem with existing legislation has already been identified, going through the entire impact assessment process would be unnecessary. Instead, local authorities will have the ability to request legislation is amended. Throughout this bill, the government has been keen to suggest that the inclusion of any retrospective impact assessment mechanism would be some kind of bureaucratic burden and that we would be creating scope for endless assessments of every piece of legislation. But I don't think this is the case with these amendments. Under both mine and Liam MacArthur's amendments, local authorities are required to make the case as to why any given piece of legislation should be assessed or amended. If the request is groundless, it would be rejected. But moreover, we should trust local authorities not to make frivolous or unnecessary requests. Given that this bill came about following the excellent work done by island authorities and our islands, our future, it would be disappointing to send a message to those island communities that we do not trust them to highlight legitimate concerns over the impact of existing legislation and we won't give them a formal mechanism to do so. And just as legislation should be subject to the new duties created by this bill, so too should the policies, strategies and services of relevant authorities. Amendment 10 by Hamza Youssef requires relevant authorities to review policies, strategies and services to ensure that they are compliant with their new statutory duty to have regard for island communities. As the Minister said, Amendment 10 came about as a result of my discussion with the Minister after Stage 2. Members may recall that at Stage 2, I proposed an amendment setting out a requirement to review a decision not to conduct an island communities impact assessment. I didn't press my amendment at that time after the Minister indicated that he would bring forward a suitable amendment at Stage 3, which I appreciate is done, and I would therefore hope that all members would support Amendment 10. Amendment 33 in my name requires that any regulations brought forward as a result of Amendment 28 should be subject to affirmative procedure. This simply adds an element of oversight and accountability to ensure that ministers bring forward a scheme that is in keeping with the spirit of the amendment as well as the letter of the law and requires the, the affirmative endorsement of Parliament. 
I have got a great deal of sympathy for the intention of Amendment 24 by Peter Chapman, which seeks to ensure that relevant authorities' existing policies are subject to island impact assessments. I am, however, concerned that this amendment, as it is worded, would create an unreasonable and unnecessary burden for the relevant authorities. Under this amendment, they would be required to conduct an impact assessment on any policy, strategy or service that has at any point had a significantly different impact on an island's community, regardless of whether it continues to. Furthermore, I believe this amendment's aim that is to ensure that existing policies must be subject to the new statutory duty to have regard for island communities is already met in Amendment 10, which requires relevant authorities to review their policies, strategies and services as needed to ensure they comply with this duty. My interpretation of Amendment 25, also by Peter Chapman, has a similar purpose to Amendment 26 in my name, but I'm concerned that it may weaken the existing provision. Under my amendment, relevant authorities would be required to provide an explanation as to why they did not conduct an island impact assessment in relation to any decision affecting an island community. Under Peter Chapman's amendment, it would seem that they would only be required to do so in instances where the effect is likely to be significantly different from its effects on other communities. This is an important distinction, distinction and significantly raises the bar with regards to which decisions require an explanation. In instances where relevant authorities do not consider an impact assessment necessary on the grounds that the policy will not have a significantly different impact on island communities, it is right that local communities receive an explanation as to how that decision was reached. This does not appear to be the case under Amendment 25, so we will not be supporting Amendments 24 and 25. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call Stuart Stevenson to be followed by John Finney. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. I, I speak to uh, Amendments 24 and 25 in Peter Chapman's name. Uh, in particular, uh, let us look at the wording in uh, Amendment 24, which uses the phrase, which in the authority's opinion. Now, I read that as meaning that the authority has to have an opinion. It cannot uh, avoid having an opinion. If it's to have an opinion, and we read in Amendment 24, or have had, it must have an opinion on every single thing that affects the island. Uh, it has to invest the time and effort to discover that it ends up with no material opinion on anything, but it has to have an opinion. This uh, amendment, not at this stage, this uh, amendment was brought forward at stage two to committee as amendment number 62 uh, and voted down. And at that time, I referred to the Common Good Act of 1491. And I did so because Colleen and Aylan Shear uh, has no common goods and therefore is differential from other islands. And you would need to consider the effect of the 1491 uh, act on the Western Isles compared to other islands. But I do note that the legal effect of the 1491 Act is minimal. So I bring forward a different example, um, which is not decades back, but centuries back, which is the Minority Act of 1663, um, which relates to, uh, relates to the position of minors who have property but the leasehold will expire before they achieve their majority. Now, is there a difference in the islands? Well, actually there is, because in Orkney and Shetland, we have a property law called Eudal Law, and we only have it on those two groups of islands. And Eudal Law has an effect on the way leaseholds work. And so for people with, who are minors, without tutors, are affected by that in that particular regard. Mr. Now Stevenson, that, I don't really want to halt you mid flow, but we've allocated. Nearly there. We, we've allocated one hour for this whole section. I, we, we've got John Finney to get in, so perhaps if you could bring your remarks towards a conclusion. I, I, you, you, you've just preempted me. I was going to say the final thing I wish to say is the phrase significantly different. Eudo law is significantly different, but of course it's significantly beneficially different to the Orkneys and Shetlands, but they would still be forced to consider whether they should continue it, even though it's beneficial under the wording in Amendment 25. Yeah, yeah, yeah. John Finney. Um, thank you, President Officer. Um, 
My, my colleague Lee MacArthur used the, the, the phrase, the centrepiece of this legislation being island proofing, and it certainly was a phrase that, that certainly recurred frequently. Um, and um, that's led to a lot of expectations, uh, not least with regard to the question of retrospection. And whilst I think no reasonable person would expect uh, there to be a blank check associated with this, and the fact that uh, a retrospective application for uh, legislation is unusual, I think. Um, of the amendments that are, are pressed before us, uh, pushed before us, and I would urge Liam MacArthur to, to press his, um, it's measured and it's proportionate. Um, and uh, so I hope he does press it, and I hope members will all support uh, the, the Minister's amendment at, uh, at number 10. Thank you. Thank you very much. And as we're nearing the agreed time limit, I'm prepared to exercise my power under Rule 9.8.48 to allow the debate in this group to continue beyond the limit in order to avoid the debate being unreasonably curtailed. However, at this stage, I'm going to ask Peter Chapman to wind up and to move or to press or withdraw his amendment. Uh, I'm only going to state I will, I will move my, press my amendment. Thank you very much, Mr Chapman. In that case, the question is that Amendment 24 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote in Amendment Number 24 in the name of Peter Chapman is yes, 28, no, 94. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 25 in the name of Peter Chapman, already debated. Peter Chapman, to move or not move? Since it's consequential in 24, I will not move. Thank you very much. So we turn now to Group 4. And I call Amendment 26 in the name of Colin Smith, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. Colin Smith to move Amendment 26 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Presider. Officer, Amendment 26 in my name amends the wording of my Stage 2 amendment requiring that, mm -hmm. should a relevant authority decide not to conduct an island impact assessment, it must publish an explanation as to why. This amendment clarifies that this is only in relation to policies, strategies and, or services which have an effect on an island community. However, I should be clear this is not intended to weaken or limit the current provision and will only exclude decisions that are entirely irrelevant to island communities. Amendment 9 by Hamza Youssef concerns a review mechanism in island impact assessments. In their Stage 1 report, the committee describes such a mechanism as essential, a view I entirely share. If island communities are to have faith in the process, there must be greater accountability. The introduction of a review mechanism is a straightforward way to ensure that decisions can be challenged and the voices of island communities are heard. However, the wording proposed by the Minister makes the creation of this mechanism a possibility. I believe that it should be a requirement, and Amendment 9A in my name seeks to ensure this would be the case. Amendment 2 by Tavish Scott requires that the guidance issued in relation to authorities' new duty to have regard for island communities must be approved by the Parliament before it comes into force. I can understand fully why Tavish Scott wishes this to be included in the Bill. Indeed, a great deal of the Bill's potential remains to be realised. Its impact and scope are dependent, for example, on the development of guidance, regulations and the National Islands Plan. And as a result, there is a strong case for parliamentary oversight when it comes to future provisions. So I'm sympathetic to this amendment if Tavish Scott moves it. I have no objection to Amendment 11 by Hamza Youssef, and likewise, I'm happy to support Amendment 15 in his name. 
Amendment 5 by Tavish Scott outlines ministers' duties to consult island communities on changes to any relevant policy, strategy or service. Clearly, establishing island communities' rights and ministers' responsibilities in this regard is very beneficial in my view and I have no objections to this amendment. Finally, Amendment 34 in my name simply edits the wording of my Stage 2 amendment, including integrated joint boards on the list of relevant authorities to help to future-proof the provision and ensure that any changes are automatically captured. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call the Minister to speak to Amendment 9 and the other <coughs> amendments in this group. Thank you, uh, President Officer. I'll speak to the amendments uh, in this group. I'm happy to support uh, Colin Smith's Amendment 26, having discussed with him the impact of his amendment that puts the new Section 8.4 into the, the Bill at Stage 2. Uh, I welcome that he has lodged Amendment 26. Uh, it will provide helpful clarification that relevant authorities would not be required to publish reasons for not undertaking an island's community impact assessment when the policy strategy or service does not impact on an island's community in any way. I'm also happy to support Amendment 34 from Colin Smith. It is a technical change to future proof an amendment he made at stage two that included all the integrated joint boards as relevant authorities in schedule one of the bill. Amendment nine and 15 are in my name. At stage two, Colin Smith put forward an amendment which attempted to create a legislative process that would allow for a review of a relevant authority decision not to undertake an island community impact assessment. There were a number of problems with that amendment and I offered to come back at stage three with a revised proposition and a compromise. Uh, this was to put in place a power that would allow ministers to make regulations with respect to reviews. The approach taken is that if the experience of the operation of these new island proofing measures in the bill identifies issues and problems, and that review would be beneficial, then a review process can be put in place based on the evidence. That to me seems to be the sensible approach to take to enable a remedy to be sought should one be required, rather than imposing a remedy before anyone could determine if one might be needed. Taking a power to set up a review mechanism by regulations also allows greater flexibility. And while the provision is silent on this, my intention would also be to enable the views and feedback of stakeholders and communities to inform how best to implement subsections 2A to F to ensure we get the most effective way for reviews to take place. While Amendment 31 in the name of Jamie Green will be discussed in Group 10, it can be considered as complementary to my Amendment 9. Uh, that amendment will put in place a review mechanism on the operation of the Act as a whole, including the provision on island communities' impact assessments, and for that review to take place within four years of Royal Assent. Taken together, these amendments will provide the evidence to reach a conclusion as to whether a separate review process is required and the means to put that into effect. Uh, on that basis, I would ask members to support Amendment 9 and also to support Amendment 15, which is a technical amendment to ensure the regulations are subject to the affirmative procedure. Uh, on that basis, I cannot support Amendment 9A brought forward by Colin Smith. He, his amendment replaces the word may with the word must and essentially means that we cannot wait until the report and evaluation of the Act, nor indeed uh, to establish uh, if any evidence emerges of the need to review, for a review process. Instead, ministers must make regulations to set up the review process as soon as we can after the provisions come into force. This to me seems unnecessary, it seems disproportionate and risks creating a process for the process sake without thinking through the resources, but indeed also indeed not thinking about whether or not uh, that process uh, is needed. It could be that we get to the review uh, within the Act and decide that that is not needed, uh, but unfortunately we would have to do so because of Colin Smith's amendment. Uh, but I do understand why Colin Smith, Colin Smith thinks this might be needed. Uh, what I can give him is an undertaking on the record that we will evaluate the operation of the impact assessments process and that we will create a review process should one be necessary with the statutory underpinning as set out. I hope this is sufficient to persuade the member not to move Amendment 9A and if he does I would ask other members to vote against it. Uh, amendment 11 uh, as I've said in my name is another technical amendment. Uh, the criteria under section 12.3 were changed at stage two by Jamie Green to add in a financial implications requirement for the section 12 island communities impact assessment and legislation. Uh, this means that the criteria in section 12.3 are now different and more onerous to those under 8.3. So my amendment makes it clear that an assessment completed under the more stringent section 12 is also considered to be an island's community impact assessment under sections eight and therefore demonstrates compliance under section seven. Uh, amendment 2 from Tavish Scott is the same amendment he put forward uh, as, an, as Amendment 23 at Stage 2. 
As I said at the time, I can understand what you're seeking to achieve, but, but I cannot support it. The content of guidance is crucial to understanding what is expected of public bodies in practice in relation to implementing and delivering the island proofing duty. Section 10 makes it clear that public authorities will be expected to follow that guidance, which will be developed in full consultation with island authorities, island communities and other relevant stake stakeholders. I am determined to ensure that is a meaningful process. However, Amendment 2 would stop the application of that guidance until Parliament has considered it and approved it. It has the potential to substantially slow down implementation of the island proofing duty. It would also require potentially every iteration of the guidance to come before Parliament for approval, meaning that relatively small changes or additions would be subject to a lengthy and cumbersome process. Uh, I believe it would reduce flexibility and adapt adaptability and would slow things down. So the guidance uh, will we'll need to adapt uh, with experience to highlight good pro practice and caution against bad practice. Um, it's not normal practice for the Parliament to approve what is still in guidance issued by Scottish Ministers rather than guidance issued by the Parliament itself. For that very good reason, the Parliament has limited time and resources. So to look at detailed guidance every time it's changed would be quite a burden. So I did offer a compromise at stage two and I'm ho happy to offer it. Again, I committed to bring before Parliament the very first version of the guidance in draft before it is published so that Parliament could contribute to the development process. That seems like the most important stage for members to have sight of the guidance rather than every single time it is altered. So I undertake to do that and on that basis I would ask Tavish Scott not to move Amendment 2 and if he does I would ask members to vote against it. Uh, Amendment 5 is also from Tavish Scott. I am grateful for the member, um, uh, for, for, the member uh, for putting this one uh, forward. He puts in a further step for ministers after they have prepared an island community's impact assessment under Section 8 requiring ministers to undertake a further consultation in certain circumstances when a quote-unquote material change takes place. I do have some worries that it introduces a new term, material change, which is not used in the bill, and it's a process that could uh, add another layer of complexity. However, I do understand the principle behind the amendment, so therefore I'm happy to support it. Thank you very much. And I call Tavish Scott to speak to Amendment 2 and the other amendments in this group. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. I was terribly tempted to start with a debate on noodle law, but I, I, I think we'll um, spare that one for another, uh, another uh, day. Uh, I've actually really exercised to introduce, introduce a, an amendment on noodle law, but um, there'll be a bill at some stage where we can do that. Um, I want to speak very briefly to 2 and 5. Um, firstly, I hear what the Minister says on uh, the, the facts around the guidance uh, in terms of bringing a first draft to Parliament. I also recognise what he says about this uh, amendment slowing down uh, island proofing, which is very, very much against what I would be uh, arguing for. So while, as Colin Smith uh, rather well set out, the arguments are in favour of guidance uh, being adequately and properly scrutinised, and indeed this is an enabling piece of legislation, and therefore it's important that, uh, that any uh, bill constructed in that way is properly scrutinised by Parliament, I take the Minister's line that uh, that first draft that he's read onto the record this evening, uh, that first draft being presented to Parliament uh, allows uh, proper scrutiny, not just with, um, with uh, committees and members of this place, uh, but also, of course, with the island communities uh, themselves. So on that basis, I'm minded not to, to move to. Uh, on five, uh, to be honest, uh, let me be blunt about this. This amendment wouldn't be here but for uh, Highlands and Islands uh, Airports uh, Limited because the principle of consultation is enshrined in numerous government documents of all political persuasions. And yet Highlands and Islands Airport Limited, who are, for those who don't know, wholly owned by uh, the government and always uh, have been, uh, have imposed or plan to impose uh, car parking charges on Kirkwall, Stornoway and Sumbra without uh, consultation. They have flatly refused to consult, uh, which uh, no one in the islands uh, is uh, at all appreciative of, and nor, I believe, should the government uh, either. Hyle's defence, and I won't even give them credit for having mounted one, is that they know the answer to the question, would you like to pay for parking at our uh, airports? Uh, but can you imagine, can government imagine the circumstances where a council, say Shetland Lions Council, uh, decided to close a school and said, well, we're not going to bother consulting parents because we know what they would say. Not unsurprisingly, the government would say, no, you can't do that, you must consult, and here's why. There's legislation, there's, there's all these documents, there's your own uh, d uh, strategies and, and many other mechanisms in place. You must consult. So I cannot conceive of how uh, a government agency, in this case, Highlands Islands Airports Limited, 
cannot, uh, can get away with not being allowed to consult on this. And on, and on that basis, I hope the Minister, even at this late stage, will recognise that in the context of island proofing, it is extremely important that they are made to consult uh, and do it properly and do it in, a, in the right uh, way, just as any other local authority or public agency would have to do. Uh, and on that basis, and that's the basis for this amendment, I, I ask members to support it. And I call Peter Chapman. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, we will be supporting Amendment 26 in the name of Colin Smith, as it provides a safeguard to relevant authorities who may not have the time or the resources to publish reports uh, quickly, and it gives them time to, uh, and a degree of latitude with the wording, and I quote from his, from his amendment, as soon as reasonably practical afterwards and in such manner as it considers appropriate. So I think that is appropriate. We also support Amendment 9 in the name of the Minister, uh, but only if it's amended by Amendment 9A in the name of Colin Smith, because Amendment 9 adds a section to review decisions by, made by Ministers on island uh, communities impact assessments. And uh, although I'm glad to see this section added by the Minister, I feel Colin Smith's Amendment 9A is necessary, which changes the word may to must, ensuring that this appeals decision must be put into, into the bill is very important. And this was a recommendation at stage one, and it is important to enable relevant authorities to challenge a decision on their island impact assessment they feel has, has significantly impacted their community, but has not been successfully assessed. We also support Amendment 2 in the name of David Scott, which ensures Scottish ministers must lay the guidance they propose to issue to island authorities before the Scottish Parliament, and it is subsequently approved. This ensures there will be cross-party scrutiny and that local authorities will receive the best guidance for their community. We support Amendment 15, which is a technical amendment. We are also going to support um, uh, Amendment 11 in the name of the Minister, because this uh, it comes about as a result of uh, Amendment 31, I think it is, by my colleague Jamie Green, which is, is yet to be debated. And in, the, in light of the comments by the Minister just now, we feel we can now support that amendment. We also support Amendment 5, which would add a new section to the bill, ensuring island communities are statutory consultees. We also support Amendment 34, which is another technical amendment to terms of bodies listed in the schedule. Presiding officer. Thank you, Mr Chapman. And I call on Colin Smith to wind up in this group and to press or withdraw Amendment 26. Uh, press Amendment 26. Thank you. So the question is that Amendment 26 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 9 in the name of the Minister, already debated, Minister, to move formally. Move. And before we vote on that, I call Amendment 9A in the name of Colin Smith, already debated. Colin Smith, to move or not move? Uh, move. That is moved. So the question is that Amendment 9A be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We move to a vote and members may press their votes now. Thank you. The result of the vote on Amendment Number 9A in the name of Colin Smith is yes, 62, no, 60. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. <laughs> so can I ask the Minister, does he wish to press withdraw the amended Amendment 9? Uh, moved. Moved. The question is that Amendment 9, which is now amended, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. 
We are agreed. I call Amendment 10 in the name of the Minister. Already debated with Amendment 24. Minister, to move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment 10 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 2 in the name of Tavish Scott. Tavish Scott, to move or not move? Move. Not Tavis. moved. I call Amendment 11 in the name of the Minister. Minister, to move formally. Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 11 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And we move on now to Group 5, and I call Amendment 4, Amendment 4 sorry, in the name of Tavish Scott and a group of its own. Tavish Scott to move and speak to Amendment 4. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This amendment uh, requires Scottish ministers to prepare an island community's impact assessment in relation to existing legislation and strategies on waste management. That impact assessment must describe the effect of the legislation strategies on the recovery and disposal of waste in island communities. And I take the arguments that Jamie Green and, and uh, other uh, members were making earlier in relation to the, to, to the list, but the specific purpose I've uh, brought this amendment to Parliament this afternoon is in relation to the waste flow uh, in, in Shetland. It's, a, it's actually a, a very simple issue. Waste uh, is used in, the, in a waste to energy plant, uh, which, then is, uh, which then heats water and is pumped through Lerwick's district heating system. That heating system uh, heats the Gilbert Bain Hospital in Lerwick, the care centres across, uh, across the capital, uh, many of the islands, or well, certainly of, the, of Lerwick schools, and also many, in, uh, many homes. Uh, and that is the point uh, of of, uh, recycling uh, the way it's done there. It was built uh, using uh, both local and government uh, monies uh, many uh, years ago, and it does complete a waste uh, loop. Now, I appreciate there is much that can be said about waste regulation that has changed and will continue to, to change, but the, uh, the importance here in this amendment is simply to ensure that uh, waste uh, legislation and strategies that government and local government uh, uh, devise and adhere to uh, uh, does understand the dynamics of uh, what happens in Ireland. And, and in the case of the example I've given, that isn't currently uh, the case. And I'd uh, look to the Minister for some recognition of that uh, and hope that he might be able to find a way uh, to uh, deal with that in the context of this amendment. Thank you very much. I call Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Jamie Green. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, briefly, Presiding Officer. Um, I, I suspect the one thing it would be worth uh, saying is that uh, islands are allowed to be different in all sorts of different ways. And... Uh, the substantial point. But I've really got some technical issues uh, about uh, 2C, uh, which is uh, hooking the whole thing to royal assent. And it's worth looking at what the bill actually says. It only actually, uh, on the day of royal assent, only sections 1, 2, uh, 20 and 22 uh, come into force. So it would not include this particular amendment. So I think there's a wee bit of a, a construction uh, lacuna in the way uh, this amendment is made. And in any event, uh, given that the Royal Assent point for this bill only creates the housekeeping bits, doesn't actually create any powers, it will only be uh, when uh, a subsequent piece of uh, secondary legislation or commencement order is brought forward that the bill and any parts of it that matter to islands will come into effect. So I'm a wee bit of doubt that uh, uh, Tavis Scott might address in his closing remarks about the construction uh, of the amendment he's put before us. And Jamie Green to be followed by John Finney. Jamie Green. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I'd like to thank uh, Tavis Scott for bringing this to the attention of the uh, Chamber via this amendment. Uh, I think, you know, just to recap on his point, we, it, it's a sort of amendment that, again, is a very specific issue that relates uh, to a very localised area on, on a specific island. Uh, and I see what he's seeking to address with this. I mean, one could argue that this bill is not the place to address specific uh, environmental issues such as this. But then again, I'd say to Mr Scott, this is the island's bill, and if no, uh, this isn't the place and now isn't the time, then, then where is and, and, and when? So uh, I think for that reason, there's nothing particularly uh, to disagree in the amendment, and he will have the support of these benches, therefore. Thank you very much. I call John Finney. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, I think this is a, a graphic example of where the geography and, and 
Mr. Scott uses the phrase understanding the dynamics. Here, here's, here's a very clear case of a, a, a situation where you could argue of conflicting policies and there may be an expectation that I'll be rising up to say something, I'm, but I'm not going to say, and that is we need to be pragmatic uh, uh, about our approach. We need to look at everything in the round. Um, and if Mr. Scott presses his amendment, these benches will certainly be supporting it. Thank you, and I call the Minister. Thank you. I appreciate there are challenging issues uh, that remote communities, including those, of course, on our islands, uh, can face in terms of meeting our policy ambitions for tackling waste. Uh, that is why we continue to work closely with island councils through Zero Waste Scotland to assist them in achieving compliance. Uh, with regard to the existing legislation in place, uh, I'm aware that island councils are making steady progress towards achieving compliance. In Shetland, for example, we expect the recycling rate to increase significantly as their new recycling services are rolled out with assistance from Zero Waste Scotland, particularly in light of Shetland Island Council's decision in 2017 to sign the Scottish Household Recycling Charter. Uh, a retrospective impact assessment on existing legislation and strategies, as proposed by this amendment, I believe would be of little value because of significant amount of our existing law and policy is underpinned by European Parliament and indeed Council directives. Any deviation from those requirements could result in costly infraction proceedings uh, being undertaken. I think it's more constructive to focus on the practical steps needed to improve recycling performance and consider waste management options, which is what we're doing through Zero Waste Scotland. However, bearing in mind I think very good points that Tavish Scott has articulated uh, on, on the record, I'm happy to commit to a review of the best practical environmental options for the collection and processing of recyclable waste uh, in Shetland in order to assist island councils in their duties. I'm happy to ask my colleague, Cabinet Secretary, for the environment, climate change and land reform to meet with Mr Scott to discuss this work and indeed bring together the relevant stakeholders uh, in that regard. I believe that uh, she has given that undertaking to, to, to Mr Scott outside of this chamber and I'm happy to commit to it once again uh, on that record. And I hope that uh, given these assurances, uh, Mr Scott uh, will withdraw his amendments. Thank you, and I call on Tavis Scott to wind up and to press or withdraw his amendment. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I just uh, thank, thank colleagues for uh, speaking to this amendment in the way in which they have, particularly take John Finney's uh, point, given his uh, party's uh, <laughs> position on, on what I might call a waste energy plant and he might call something else. Um, uh, but uh, can I just make two points? Firstly, the, um, I totally take the Minister's uh, point about a government review of, of best environmental options. I accept that uh, concession and, uh, and accept it in the spirit in which he gave it, and I'm grateful to, uh, to him for it. The other uh, side that does does strike me having Parliament having passed Amendment 12 in Liam MacArthur's name um, that, we, uh, that we debated some minutes ago. Uh, there is now uh, a mechanism in place also to uh, pursue this issue in a different way. Uh, so those two factors to me make clear that uh, uh, the parties that need to come together uh, at home just to resolve this matter in the, in the round uh, can do so using what Parliament said today and what the Minister said and on that basis I wouldn't move this amendment. Thank you very much. As it happens, we actually now come to Amendment 12. So I'm going to call Amendment 12 in the name of Liam MacArthur, already debated. Liam MacArthur, to move or not move? Moved. Moved. The question is that Amendment 12 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 28 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated. Colin Smith, to move or not move? To move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 28 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote on Amendment 28. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 28 in the name of Colin Smith is yes 56, no 66. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. 
We turn now to Group 6. I call Amendment 27 in the name of Colin Smith, grouped with Amendments 13, 32 and 16. Colin Smith to move Amendment 27 and speak to all the amendments in this group. Thank you, President Officer. Amendment 27 in my name would require Ministers to create a scheme in which local authorities can request the devolution of functions to be considered. And similarly, Amendment 13 by Liam MacArthur would require the creation of a scheme for local authorities to request additional powers. Amendments 32 and 16 require both schemes to be subject to affirmative procedures. Either of Amendments 27 or 13 would make an invaluable contribution to the Bill and accordingly I will be supporting both. The Bill was created on the basis that island communities have unique and varied needs and it purports to strengthen these communities, yet it could do more by way of community empowerment and the strengthening of decision-making powers for those communities. These amendments would create a mechanism whereby island authorities can request additional powers if needed. This would improve their ability to respond to specific local problems and develop policy in line with a community's own needs and priorities. It would put power in the hands of local communities and help to protect island communities against centralisation. As was the case with the amendments on retrospective island proofing requests, a case would have to be made for these powers by the relevant local authority. These amendments are not seeking to overburden already stretched councils with powers they do not want, nor would they create a system where any power can be devolved automatically on request. The systems being proposed are practical and balanced. Presiding officer, there has been much debate in recent months, rightly so, about so-called power grabs and which power should or should not be devolved to this parliament. But what is often forgotten is our local councils. As more and more powers come to the Scottish Parliament from the UK Parliament, they should not automatically rest in Edinburgh, which can often seem distant from our island communities. If this parliament genuinely believes in local democracy, then it should support the modest mechanisms in the proposed amendments that could make this happen for our island communities. Thank you very much. Can I call on Lee MacArthur to speak to Amendment 13 and the other amendments in this group? Thank you, President Officer. Can I start by associating myself with the comments Colin Smith has made? I think, rather like the earlier amendments on retrospective uh, island proofing, I'm conscious that he and I have our tanks parked figuratively on each other's lawns. Uh, and for the record, I'm not partisan uh, in terms of uh, which of uh, the amendments mine or Colin Smith's parliament chooses to support uh, shortly. In terms of my Amendment 13, and the consequential amendment 16, uh, these are an attempt to future-proof the legislation. As uh, Donald Dewar once wisely observed, devolution is a process, not an event. This bill should not, must not, be the sum total of our ambition to empower our island communities. We must leave open the possibility, uh, the option, even the encouragement uh, for local authorities acting in the interests of the communities they represent to request additional functions and responsibilities where appropriate. Granting any such request would not be a foregone conclusion. A robust case would need to be made weighing up both the pros and the cons. By the same token, any refusal by ministers would need to be based on sound evidence and subject to an appeal. As with my approach on retrospective island proofing, I believe Amendment 13 is both reasonable and proportionate in meeting what has been a consistent demand from all three island authorities for some time. And on that basis, I hope it, or indeed Colin uh, Smith's Amendment 27, will find support across the chamber. Thank you. Thank you. I call Jamie Green to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Jamie Green. <clears throat> Thank you, Presiding Officer. I, I, I rise to uh, support I uh, give the support of these benches to both uh, uh, 17 and 13 in this instance. I think they make very important points. Uh, as a member of the Rural Economy and Cognitive Committee, we took a lot of evidence throughout this process uh, uh, of this bill. And uh, much of the, uh, the evidence that we got from people on islands themselves was about uh, a de decentralization of power uh, and decision making. And that decisions that are made closer to communities uh, are better, uh, and all this does, uh, all these amendments do, is facilitate uh, schemes for requests for uh, the further devolution of uh, specific functions where they can be considered. Uh, so it's not uh, going to uh, create this uh, major new governance framework change. I don't think this bill is the place to do that, uh, but I think the, uh, the rationale behind these uh, amendments uh, is an important one for us to consider in the context of what the Islands Bill is seeking to achieve. So for that reason, we will support uh, all the amendments in this group. Thank you very much. And I call Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Colin Smith, in his uh, introductory remarks, uh, said islands have unique and varied needs, and I absolutely agree with him. Uh, Jamie Green, in the remarks he's just made, talked about decision-making uh, being brought closer to the islands. 
But I, I have to say, in reading these two amendments, I see quite the opposite effect uh, in the way they do. What they do is they prevent the islands from deciding how to present a case uh, for devolution. They mandate and require that we here dictate to them how they must be constructed. They will inevitably require, in ensuring that they're making their requests in the legal form if they pass either of these amendments, that lawyers in the local authorities will need to verify that they're presented in the legal form. Quite frankly, I trust local authorities and I'd much rather they decided uh, how to put forward amendments because it uh, put forward requests because neither of these amendments actually create any new powers for local authorities at all. What they actually do by contrast is they handcuff local authorities to do things in a particular way that's prescribed in one or other of these amendments. I feel very uncomfortable about that approach. I, I will, yes. Uh, for taking the intervention. I, I think what the amendments do, though, is, is put in place a process. Now, you may take issue with the process. The island authorities are supportive of the amendments that uh, we've launched. Yeah. But they put in place a process that's not there at the moment. And therefore, the mechanism whereby those additional powers may be devolved to local authorities is, is absent. And therefore, I think without one of these amendments passing, uh, we miss an opportunity within this bill uh, to future-proof it, to allow those powers, those responsibilities, to be exercised more appropriately at a local level where that is uh, desired. Well, Stuart Stevenson. If, if, if I may, President Officer, I, I disagree. There is a process, it's there, and the whole bill empowers uh, island uh, communities and local authorities, because, of course, it's communities and local authorities. It's not just about saying what local authorities have to do. I mean, Colin Smith's amendment even goes on to say specifying how the consultation has to be undertaken by the authority before they submit things. And I, I don't, that now, recognising what Tavish Scott had to say about consultation in Hyle, which had some merit, um, I'm, I'm very reluctant to consider putting handcuffs and describing for local authorities and creating potentially additional legal costs for them when actually they can do everything. If we don't pass either of these amendments, this doesn't stop any local authority and any community out with the local authority from putting a request in that uh, the rules should be changed to benefit their community. I call on John Finney. Um, thank you, President Officer. Uh, devolving power is what Greens are about, and uh, I mean, there's clear role for the recipients of the power that is devolved, and indeed their communities. And lest we all think that this is um, some sort of nirvana, we did certainly hear when we were out about the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee that some committees were wary of some powers going to local authorities. Um, and I am aware of ongoing reviews and work with the, the ministers, uh, with COSLA. Um, however, um, I don't think we can wait forever. This is the vehicle on which uh, some of this can be delivered. I think there are challenges. I think there are challenges not least because uh, half the recipients have landward areas too, and most local authorities, if not all, will have some seaborne um, uh, coastline where they might ha have aspirations as well. So, uh, all things considered, I think there will be a lot of work required, but that will be in the discussion over the regulation. So, we'll be supportive of 27 and 13. And I call on the Minister. Uh, presenting officer, amendments 13 from Lee MacArthur and 27 from Colin Smith seek to uh, allow island authorities to request the devolution of functions from Scottish ministers. These amendments were debated at stage two, all the more way that Colin Smith has amended his version following uh, defeat at uh, the committee. There's two main reasons why uh, we, will not, we will not be supporting uh, the amendments. One uh, is because we don't think this is the right place for it, but secondly, we also think that this could have a negative unintended consequence on island communities as opposed to necessarily uh, councils. In terms of the right place for this discussion, of course, in December last year, we took that important step on the community empowerment journey when we jointly launched the local governance review <clears throat> with COSLA. The purpose of the review is to reform the way Scotland is governed at a local level. Our approach is built on work done by others on this issue. For example, in, COS, uh, for example, in the COSLA back Commission on Strengthening Local Democracy, and the 2014 report of this Parliament's Local Government and Regeneration Committee inquiry into the flexibility and autonomy of local government. Uh, the review's focus on local governance means considering a wide range of Scotland's public services, not just councils, over which local people may want more control. 
under the joint political oversight arrangements, the government <clears throat> and the cause of leadership will meet next month to discuss an invitation to individual local authorities, community planning partnerships, regional partnerships, and other public sector organisations to come forward with the proposal for place-specific alternative approaches to governance. Indeed, in last year's PFG, uh, we made a commitment to support those island authorities who want to, for example, establish a single authority model of delivering local services. And we know island authorities are already actively working with local partners to develop those concrete proposals. The review is part of a process that will include a local democracy bill that we are committed to introducing in this parliament. That, will that bill will provide a more appropriate legislative vehicle in which to make provisions for the transfer of powers as this will be built on the collaborative work undertaken throughout the review. It will also ensure full and proper consultation on such a significant issue as the transfer of powers, which was not available to us at stage two or three of the bill when these amendments have been discussed. In relation to uh, my second point on local communities, uh, our starting point has always been that local communities hold uh, is, is the power that local communities hold rather than the powers held by, by those institutions. Uh, local, communi local communities and local government, uh, local communities as opposed to local government is where we want to ultimately see uh, power transferred. I know this from the many island visits uh, that I have undertaken, uh, that local councils for some island communities can seem as distant to them as, for example, Holyrood. I would travel to many islands in Argyll and Butte, or perhaps in, in, in Barra in, in, in the Western Isles, uh, where, for example, they would suggest that their council, for them, seemed as distant, as I say, uh, as, as perhaps uh, even uh, Holyrood might well be. So, therefore, uh, we want to ensure that uh, power is ultimately devolved to local uh, communities, and that should not be conflated uh, necessarily uh, with uh, local government. So, on Monday, the Scottish Government invited people the length and breadth of Scotland to join a conversation about community decision-making to help make public service more locally focused. Uh, that conversation is called Democracy Matters. It will run for six months. We can expect many good ideas to emerge from that conversation with island communities. Uh, as you all know, communities on islands have often blazed the trail in community self-determination, whether that's community development trusts, making use of renewables, community land owners driving inclusive economic development, or indeed the recent buyout of Ulva by the Mull Community Woodlands Company. So whilst I and my colleagues across government agree with the spirit of these amendments, we believe it's necessary that something as fundamental as the transfer of power needs to go through a proper and rigorous engagement and consultation process, which would be best achieved through the local governance review process. So I therefore cannot support these amendments as they stand. In particular, Colin Smith's amendment focuses on promoting legislation, and I believe that uh, may be too restrictive, as there may be other avenues that are not legislative that could better meet such requests from authorities. So confining, so confining uh, perhaps, as opposed to, to liberating. Uh, as such, I would ask both Colin Smith and Lee MacArthur not to press their amendments. Thank you very much. And I call on Colin Smith now to wind up in this group and to press or withdraw Amendment 27. Thank you, President Officer. I have to say I fundamentally disagree with the concerns of Stuart Stevenson, and more importantly, so do the island authorities themselves. It's a strange concept for Stuart Stevenson to accuse island authorities of trying to handcuff themselves. The amendments in mine and Liam MacArthur's names put in place a mechanism which doesn't already exist to potentially devolve more powers to our island communities. I think both amendments 27 and 13 should be supported and then I'm sure it would be possible to bring forward regulations to deal with both. The Minister has said there is no need for amendments which provide such a mechanism to devolve more powers mm -hmm. to our communities because it will be dealt with in a possible future local democracy bill. My response would simply be this. If you support more power to our island communities, then vote to provide them with a mechanism to request those powers. Don't wait for a bill that may or may not include such a provision sometime in the future, which Parliament may or may not pass. We have a duty to consider the legislation before us now, not what may come at a later date. I would therefore urge members to support all the amendments within this group, and I would uh, move my Amendment 27. Thank you very much. And the question is that Amendment 27 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We move to divisions. The first in the groups, so there's a one minute division. Members may cast their votes now.
The result of the vote on amendment number 27 in the name of Colin Smith is yes, 62, no, 60. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I call amendment five in the name of Tavish Scott, already debated. Tavish Scott to move or not move? move. That's moved. The question is that amendment five be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Now, before I turn to the next group, and we're just slightly ahead of schedule, I'm going to take a short comfort break. Uh, so we'll return again at 15.50. Short comfort break of just under five minutes. 15.50.
Okay, thank you, colleagues. If I can call the Chamber back to order and we will resume business. We're going to start again at Group 7. And I call Amendment 3 in the name of Tavish Scott in a group of its own. Tavish Scott to speak to him, sorry, to move and to speak to Amendment 3. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. This uh, amendment creates a Shetland mapping requirement. It would stop with a single vote the intensely annoying practice to islanders that, ha that they have put up for, with for too long, which is that of placing Shetland not in its correct place 200 miles to the north of Aberdeen, but instead in a box off the Scottish coast, whether it be the Murray coast, the Orkney coast or any other coast, it's not the right coast. So we will no longer accept the lazy interpretation of a map uh, which we have put up with uh, for uh, so long. And I say that about governments of all political persuasions, including governments of a certain political persuasion that I may have been involved in. Uh, it is right to get, it is, oh no, best to fess up on that one. Um, it, is, uh, it is before the, comes, uh, before the minister comes up with an example of it. Um, that it is right to get, this, uh, to, to get this right. And here's why. Uh, just after stage two, when we debated this uh, very fully, uh, and the minister uh, rightly drew attention to the fact that the permanent secretary had uh, addressed her, addressed the government in terms of a circular um, intimate, intimating that um, uh, maps were to be correct uh, in future. I alighted the very next day uh, when reading Twitter, which I know is something one shouldn't probably uh, do, on a tweet from the Energy Minister. And I have a, I have a copy of it here. He was, he was uh, quoting um, renewable sources. It was all good stuff. It was quoting renewable sources. But the, uh, the import on the, on the tweet was a, um, uh, was a Scottish Government uh, news release with a map of Scotland which excluded Shetland altogether. Oh. Excluded Shetland altogether. Now, uh, now, I've got, of course, Minister Paul Wheelhouse. I'd like to reassure Mr Scott that I have raised that issue with my officials and it's been addressed. Tell well, Scott. I'm, I'm grateful uh, uh, for that, no doubt. Uh, yeah, his officials uh, are uh, No doubt, as, as are his officials. <laughs> uh, I'm sure John I, Mason. I'm sure I, will. I thank the member for giving way. I mean, does he accept that? I mean, I've got a lot of sympathy because I don't think Shetland should be appearing next to Aberdeen. But the reality will be that the scale of all maps of Scotland will have to be reduced so that Shetland and everywhere else will be smaller. Tavis Scott. So, so uh, uh, I'm grateful to Mr Mason's uh, uh, intervention. That is the cartographer argument. That is the argument that uh, the, the, the men and women of maps have, have made to me and no doubt to other uh, members as well. And I just don't buy it. I just don't uh, buy it. Uh, we have uh, put up with this uh, for a long, long time. Uh, the cartographers make an intellectually coherent uh, argument. But if one lived in a different part of the country or, for example, if one was not particularly happy with the BBC weather map, which I know some colleagues exercise that view uh, during the stage two uh, debate, then uh, I, I find that uh, members of all political persuasions tend to raise that and ask it to be corrected. So uh, I understand intellectually the cartographer argument, but I just don't accept it. And if you represented Shetland, you wouldn't, rep uh, you wouldn't uh, accept it uh, either. So I, I just want to uh, recognize that uh, the minister has worked uh, hard on this. I recognize the manuscript amendment uh, he has placed in front of uh, parliament uh, today. Uh, I might ask him uh, when he's speaks to clarify the sentence in that which says pro uh, pro uh, provide in such manner as they consider appropriate uh, the reason why they cannot do something i.e. place them uh, place Shetland in the correct uh, place uh, but subject to that uh, I'm very grateful for um, colleagues support across the parties in making sure that when we pass an islands bill we put islands in the right place. Thank you very much I call the minister to speak to, to move and to speak to amendment 3a. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I know how important <clears throat> this issue is, not just for Mr Scott, but to many of us in the Chamber, and I have sympathy with the position he sets out and very much the spirit of his amendment. I think any single one of us as constituency MSPs in particular uh, would have a concern if our constituency was distorted uh, on, on any map. I know I certainly wouldn't like Glasgow Pollock to be uh, misrepresented beside uh, the, or the Central Belt or Edinburgh, heaven forfend, uh, or any such, such, thing, such thing too. So I think all of us can have sympathy uh, with the spirit of Tavish Scott's uh, amendment. I think it's important that he's brought it uh, to this debate. What I did was in stage two, uh, in subsequent conversations with the member, uh, try to highlight where I'm not convinced that legislation was necessarily the best way to deal with it. We now have a standing instruction with our publishing contractor to ensure that future images of Scotland in publications published by the Scottish Government should seek to portray the geographic location of all of Scotland's islands accurately, not just Shetland, but all of Scotland's Islands. Uh, as far as I understand, there's been no further issues since, but uh, in, in, in shaming, of course, my colleague uh, Paul Wheelhouse, he did, of course, make the point that sometimes uh, these uh, matters 
uh, can uh, arise. So therefore, uh, I think uh, I've had really useful discussions, I should say, with the member and indeed other members who represent island communities who have concerns over this issue, other ways that we can practically reinforce <coughs> this message. And I recognise that there's a continued desire for recognition of this issue in statute, specifically in relation to Shetland. So I therefore look closely at Amendment 3 and the changes in the proposal from that in Tavish Scott's Stage 2 amendment, in particular the leeway offered where an authority would be unable to comply with the mapping requirement. While some flexibility in this type of legal duty I think is a welcome improvement, I thought that un unable to comply is still a very high bar to reach and it could have, and to hopefully answer Tavish Scott's question here, it could have the, the unintended consequence of making the duty quite inflexible in a lot of cases. And I know that flexibility was a specific concern of the committee at stage two. Uh, we do not want to be too inflexible uh, in, in terms of a requirement. There may be good reasons for an authority not to comply. Indeed, it may even want to make Shetland, for whatever reason, disproportionately larger uh, on, a, on a map. My amendment three therefore suggests a slightly different test for the flexibility we're looking for. Uh, that is where ministers or a public authority consider that there are reasons not to comply then they may not follow the mapping requirement, although they must still provide information about those reasons. And I hope that also gives reassurance to Tavish Scott. It's a small change, but I think a helpful one, which will allow more discretion and flexibility where the circumstances dictate. For example, allowing different maps to be produced, where it will help the reader or the authority uh, to make a particular point uh, about Scotland. But compliance with the mapping requirement should remain a fairly high standard, taking into account that public authority has a duty to act reasonably and will not just be able to ignore the basic requirements without good reason. Amendment 3A also takes the opportunity to spell out more clearly who is covered by the duty, specifically identifying Scottish ministers and local authorities without limiting the Scottish public authorities which would be covered by Amendment 3. So I'm happy to support Amendment 3, but I ask members to also support my Amendment 3A in my name and I, of course, uh, move Amendment 3A. Thank you very much. And I call Peter Chapman to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Peter Chapman. I thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, as a group, we note Tavish Scott's amendment. And I guess this is an issue that has aggravated many people in Shetland and beyond over the years. However, having been contacted by several professional carto cartographers, and we're back to John Mason's argument, from a research institute in my region, this has led me to have some concern over this amendment. This amendment means reducing the size of the rest of Scotland by something like 40% as there is just so much water surrounding Shetland, thus losing much of the detail in any of the maps that we do produce. So therefore I support the amendment by the Minister which states that where this cannot be taken into account, an explanation can be published as to why. This gives flexibility, which I welcome. We therefore support 3A, the amendment to the amendment by the Minister, as this makes the best out of an unpractical amendment. Thank you. Nicole Stewart-Stevenson. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I very much uh, welcome uh, this particular amendment from uh, Tavish Scott. Um, he, in particular, uses the words in a manner that accurately and proportionately represents the geographical uh, location in relation to the rest of Scotland. We might even, perhaps, for the first time, uh, see um, the relationship that the Shetland Islands have to near neighbours Norway which most maps uh, utterly felt, given that they're closer to Norway than uh, many significant uh, cities uh, in the UK. Uh, I just uh, remember when I was at school, we had Mercator's projection was what produced globes and, and maps, because of course the F is round and you have to put a map on a flat surface. Um, I recommend uh, it to you that uh, you perhaps, Minister, consider using Lambert's isoconformal projection uh, which, of course, would produce not a map, not a map, but a chart. And the reason that's important is it means whenever you lay a ruler on it, you get the correct distances between any point on that chart. And therefore, if it's a chart, not a map, it is impossible for the proportion of Shetland to be other than accurately and proportionately represented. Uh, so I encourage in the implementation of the issue to consider uh, that as an option, even though it will not be legally required if, as I hope we do, we pass the amendments. 
Tavis Scott, first of all, to wind up at Amendment 3 before the Minister and 3A. Tavis Scott. Uh, thank you, Presiding I'm grateful to colleagues uh, for uh, their support and, and the Conservatives' change in position on, on, on this one. Um, it, it always strikes me as ironic. Peter Chapman from the North East uh, opposing uh, getting Shetham in the right place. Uh, I don't know how many times uh, when I, was a far, I ran the farm in a previous life that his colleagues from the North East had come up and buy lambs and used to complain about 200 miles of sea before those lambs got to, uh, to uh, Mr. Chapman's neighbours in, in the North East of uh, Scotland. If we were, if we were if we were where uh, some of Mr. Chapman's maps had us, it would be a much shorter transport distance for our lambs, but, uh, and he'd have paid £5 more ahead. But that's, uh, uh, that's for a, a different uh, debate. I, I hope the Minister was listening to Stuart Stevenson. I didn't follow all of that, but, uh, uh, but, uh, 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 but I absolutely take his point um, in that I didn't necessarily get it all, but uh, it was... Uh, <laughs> It was nevertheless an important lesson uh, for, us, uh, for us all. Uh, but the serious point is I entirely take um, and, and recognise uh, what the government have done in this area. Uh, I hope the Minister would accept that it will have to be a very good reason, um, not necessarily for me, but for, uh, for those people at home who uh, feel uh, incredibly strongly about this, uh, for a public agency or a, an authority to say, no, we're not doing it that way, we're going to do it in a different way, I still keep us in a box off the muddy coast. Uh, so, but with that, I certainly recognise what the government have done to bring this issue uh, to a sensible conclusion uh, and I'll certainly uh, support the amendment in the Minister's name. Thank you and ask the Minister to wind up on Amendment 3A. Uh, nothing really for me to add other than to, to thank members for the contributions. I think uh, we found a sensible way forward. Um, I was going to take a kind of coin of phrase from Dirty Dancing that nobody put Shetland in a corner but actually that is exactly where we're going to end up putting them uh, in the map. So uh, I'm delighted to move the amendment uh, in my name. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 3A be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. Tavish got to press or withdraw Amendment 3 uh, as amended. Moved. moved. The question is that Amendment 3 as amended be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. We turn now to Group 8 and I call Amendment 29 in the name of Jamie Green in a group of its own. Jamie Green to move and speak to Amendment 29. <coughs> uh, thank you for starting off. So this amendment uh, is around the creation uh, a big part of this bill around the creation of uh, uh, one and two member wards within local authorities on islands. Um, the needs of island communities can be quite different from those from mainland communities as we know. Now the current rules under the Local Government Boundary Commission for Scotland in the creation of uh, electoral wards give two key recommendations. One, that local, local authority wards can only comprise of three or four members and this bill seeks to address that with the potential creation and I think a welcome one at that from across the chamber of one and two member wards. But the second recommendation is around the principle of parity. And that is that across each individual local authority, that the number uh, and ratio of electors uh, per councillor shall be the same. Now, it's not e exact uh, in all wards. Uh, the Boundary Commission aims to recommend that wards have more or less than 10% variation from parity within each other. Uh, but there is not a standard uh, Scotland-wide number of electorate per, council, per, uh, per councillor. Uh, councils are divided into five categories, depending on their degrees of rurality and deprivation in the council area. Uh, if we look at the councils impacted by this bill, the three island councils uh, have a ratio of 800, 800 electors per councillor, Argyll and Butte with 2,800, and North Ayrshire in my region of 3,000. Uh, the current rules dictate uh, that there must be the same number of electorate per councillor across the entire local authority area. The problem with that is it fails to recognise uh, that islands uh, which form part of a mainland area uh, may have di very different degrees of rurality and deprivation from the adjoining mainland areas within the same local authority. This is very much the case in North Ayrshire. My amendment would uh, seek to allow the Boundary Commission to alter the ratio of electorate to member uh, on an island ward uh, within uh, a, 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 a local authority which contains islands and mainlands. Um, this does not apply to uh, all island authorities. The uh, amendment has been carefully worded to really only affect three, that is North Ayrshire, Argyll and Butte and Highlands and Islands. Uh, the effect of this uh, amendment is to revoke the rules requiring parity across the entire local uh, authority area. It will allow the Boundary Commission to consider arguments based on geography and local ties, for example, for a different ratio of electorate per councillor to apply in island wards. And it will also give the uh, Boundary Commission power to consider this, but any decision on this will be ultimately a decision for the Commission. Um, other remaining mainland parts of the local authority will be unaffected 
And the important thing to note is that the due process uh, in these requests must always be followed. Um, I have consulted with uh, North Ayrshire Council uh, on this uh, specific uh, anomaly, uh, and uh, I believe there is a broad consensus of support within North Ayrshire Council and its electorate across uh, uh, partisan, uh, partisan views. I, I will in a second. I just want to further uh, clarify uh, what this uh, amendment does. Uh, what I wouldn't want is for this bill to pass, uh, which would rightfully allow for the creation of one and two member wards. We, uh, where the net effect would be actually a reduction in representation, for example, on the Isle of Arran. Now, uh, at the moment, the 3,000 to 1 ratio would mean that if we created a, uh, a, a ward, uh, an Arran-only ward, we would uh, potentially have one councillor. So for the people of uh, Arran to have two councillors, they would need to change the ratio of around, uh, to around 1,800 to 1. Uh, to do that, that would be such a great variance uh, from parity from other wards within that uh, uh, council area and there's no precedence in doing so. In fact, the percentage of disparity uh, from parity is such uh, that um, I believe the Boundary Commission would be unable to approve that and that's what this amendment seeks to achieve. I'm happy to give way to the member. Gail Ross. Um, I thank Jamie Green for giving way. He said that he's had consultation with North Ayrshire Council, but obviously this also affects Argyll and Butte and Highland Council. Has he had any consultation with those two other councils? Jamie Green. Uh, yes, uh, I had a very long conversation on the phone last week with the leader of the Highlands and Islands Council, uh, who had some questions around the wording of it. I'm happy to um, uh, tell the Chamber <clears throat> that uh, one of the concerns that was raised was uh, whether this would be an automatic change across all island authorities. So if one island, uh, if one island within one local authority made a request to the Boundary Commission and that rule uh, was agreed to, would that have an automatic consequence across all uh, uh, other uh, island authorities? Uh, the answer to that is no, that this would still be on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, that the, 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 uh, the current process of applying to the Boundary Commission would still take precedence. And all this is doing is allowing the Boundary Commission the power to create that disparity that doesn't already exist at the moment. So yes, uh, consultation uh, has been made with other uh, authorities. Now, in the example of Virgil and Butte, for example, where there are a number of smaller islands with small populations, uh, there's nothing stopping them at the moment making representation already to the Boundary Commission to, to create a ward uh, which is subject to the, the process uh, as normal. Um, what I'm specifically asking for here is uh, an amendment which will allow the creation of uh, one and two member wards where the ratio is different. And I think it would be a shame if we passed this bill and, uh, and the result of that was that we had no tangible changes on some of our largest island communities. Uh, so I would ask members from across uh, the spectrum to support it for that reason. Thank you. I call Neil Bibby to follow by Kenneth Gibson. Neil Bibby. Thank you, President Officer. I wish to speak in support of Amendment 29 in the name of Jamie Green. As has been indicated already, this amendment relates not just to the Islands Bill, but also to the Local Government Scotland Act. Schedule 6 sets out that the number of councillors per ward based on electorate should be proportionate to the number found across the local authority as a whole. However, as Jamie Green uh, has said, there is a strong case for ensuring the Islands Bill allows for exemptions to that ratio, not just for all island wards, but for all wards which consist wholly or partly of one or more islands. North Ayrshire Council, which includes the island communities of Arran and the Cumbries, are supporting the amendment of Section 14 of the Act. To make the most of Section 14, they say there must be flexibility around the underlying ratio. In North Ayrshire, where 95% of the population lives on the mainland, the ratio of population per councillor for the authority as a whole is driven by the mainland's profile of rurality and the mainland's demographics. However, the Bill's proposals for island proofing should allow the unique characteristics of island communities to be taken into account. North Ayrshire Council believe that the Boundary Commission should be able to consider an island ratio of electorate per councillor, which reflects the profile of the island, not the mainland. This will not be possible under the current wording of the Bill. On its own, the amendment simply gives the Boundary Commission power to consider arguments that islands which have widely different demographics from their adjoining mainland should be able to have a ratio of electorate per councillor which reflects their unique circumstances. In practice, and all other things being equal, an unamended section 14, as Jamie, Kerr said, uh, Jamie Green said, could actually result in Aaron getting one less resident councillor than at present because of the application of the ratio. 
That is why North Ayrshire Council believe the Boundary Commission should have more flexibility. As Jamie Green has said, the Boundary Commission currently only have limited power to deviate from electoral parity and aim to restrict any deviation to 10%. They do not have power as things stand to propose a variation from parity of 36% in Arran or 63% in Cumbria, which is required to island-proof the democracy of North Ayrshire and create a two-member ward for Arran and a one-member <coughs> Ward for the Cumbries. That is why this amendment is required. And so, President Officer, North Ayrshire Council have made a compelling argument for this amendment. It is an amendment that will strengthen democracy and accountability in island communities in my region. And it is an amendment I will be happy to support later this afternoon. Thank you. I call Kenneth Gibson. Presiding officer, North Ayrshire Council asked me as far away as 26 September last as a constituency member to lodge an amendment such as this, which would uh, increase the number of North Ayrshire Councils from 33 to 35 by having an additional council for the island of Cumbria and an additional one for the island of Arran. I declined to support the council's position for reasons I explained, and I will share uh, with colleagues my view shortly. However, I'm curious why Mr Green is, is moving this, given that North Ayrshire Council Tories made the right song and dance about what they allege to be a waste of public money when an increase from 30 to 33 councils was mooted prior to the 2017 local authority elections. Nowhere in North Ayrshire Council's briefing does it mention that current legislation already allows the, North, uh, uh, the Local Government Boundary Commission uh, for Scotland to depart from electoral parity where special geographical considerations apply. This is paragraph two of the relevant rules which say that the strict application of the rules stated in paragraph one, two may be departed from in any area where special geographical considerations appear to render a departure desirable. I support single member wards for island communities far from the mainland and argued for this in relation to Arnott Local Government and Communities Committee when taking evidence both from Joe Fitzpatrick, Minister for Parliament and Finance Secretary Derek Mackay and both ministers expressed sympathy for this. However, I'm also in complete agreement with Schedule 6 of the Local Government Scotland Act 1973, which states that there should be parity across any local authority area. The Western Isles is 674 voters per council and North, North Ayrshire 3,294. What is important is that each vote within the local authority area is of roughly the same value. It would be completely undemocratic for a vote in Arran with two councils for 3,904 electors to be worth almost twice what a Solcoats vote uh, it would be worth, or a vote in Cumbria where there are only 1,098 electors to be worth three times more than a vote in Largs. Uh, Cumbria is an eight mile ferry trip from Largs. Other areas of Scotland, such as Argyll and Butte, would have their arrangements distorted if this amendment passed. And I have to say, not one of my constituents has contacted me to support the view expressed by the previous two speakers. Both Anne and Cumbria voted strongly SNP in recent years, and so backing such an amendment could actually benefit my party electorally. Nevertheless, as it breaks the principle of vote parity within a local authority, I urge Mr Green to withdraw Amendment 29, and if not, the Chamber to vote against it. Call the Minister. <coughs> Notwithstanding that it could benefit us politically, uh, I do uh, will be uh, not supporting uh, Jamie Green's uh, amendment uh, as uh, put forward. I think for, for a couple of reasons that Kenny Gibson uh, raises and articulates those reasons, uh, I think very, very well. Uh, if I go through uh, some of what uh, I said at stage two, just very uh, briefly, um, I think the trouble is that for North Ayrshire, North Ayrshire uh, that means potentially two uh, different ratios for two islands uh, of Arran and indeed Cumbria. Uh, Amendment 29 seeks to disapply the rule requiring electoral parity for wards that consist wholly or partly of one or more inhabited islands <coughs> and those local authorities which have both island wards and wards on the mainland of Scotland. Uh, I can agree that the bill as it stands does not change the priority uh, of electoral parity in the relevant legislation, but the current legislation does already allow for the Local Government Boundary Commission for Scotland to depart from electoral parity where special geographic considerations apply, just as Kenny Gibson has articulated that. In fact, at stage one, uh, Jimmy Green asked the chair of the commission, Ronnie Hines, a question as to whether there should be an ability to change the ratio. And I'll quote directly from Mr Hines. I think the answer is important. He said, and I quote, our feeling is that in the spirit of what the bill is seeking to achieve, the ability to have a choice between one or two member wards and three or four member wards in the islands area would probably get us to a position comparable to what's being sought. For example, we can readily construe a means by which we would change the current representation in Arran. That might mean that a ratio applied in Arran that was different from the ratio that applied in, in the rest of North Ayrshire, but to achieve such an end, there would be no need for a new provision in the bill. It could be done by means 
of what is being offered in the bill, end quote. So these statements show that the Local Government Boundary Commission for Scotland are willing to look at what could be done for each local authority area and willing to work flexibly. Whether they would be able to go as far as the member and the North Ayrshire Council want, uh, of course, is uh, a question. But I thought Gail Ross's intervention was extremely uh, important because in her question, she'd asked whether or not there'd been consultation with Aguiland Butte and indeed Highlands Council. The member uh, talked about some of the concerns that were raised in those calls, but didn't give an indication of whether those other local authorities were supportive of this or not. So if I take Aguiland Butte, for example, it has 23 inhabited islands. No doubt many of them will at some point argue the case for more island councillors. The impact potentially becomes quite onerous. Some very small islands could argue their case for their own councillor. What is to stop an island as it currently exists of only two people asking for their own councillor? Electoral reviews can already be a contentious and disputed process. And I'm not sure that this amendment would reduce the potential uh, for uh, those disagreements. I'm also not sure that the mainland parts of a local authority area will be unaffected, as Kenny Gibson uh, has highlighted in his contribution. If the Local Government Boundary Commission for Scotland maintains its approach of determining council size and then determining the wards, increasing the number of island councillors may result in a decrease on the mainland. Does the member think that will happen? Does he have a view on how we should then respond to that? If the Commission don't have that approach, don't reduce the size of the council, and there are more councillors on the island, and this could, if I take the example of a guy in Butte who have 23 islands, could, of course, increase the total number of councillors. So we could have up to 23 additional councillors in Argyle and Butte and all the, the cost and so on associated with that. Stage three of the bill process is a difficult place, I think, to bring new proposals like this uh, when we cannot reflect further on these important questions and amend later. So I think this issue would be better addressed, perhaps through appropriate local government legislation that I've already spoken about that is taking place and coming forward to this parliament, I would urge Jamie Green to withdraw. If he doesn't, then I would urge members not to support his amendment. Thank you. And I call Jamie Green to wind up on this group and to press or withdraw his amendment 20, 29. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to thank uh, uh, the majority of members for their input uh, in, in that grouping. Um, I think uh, Neil Bibby made some very valid points, perhaps uh, uh, gave the argument in a slightly different way, um, but did make reference to some important points there. Um, the, the Minister says, uh, for example, that the Boundary Commission is, he, in his view, comfortable that they can already make these ratio changes. But at the moment, the precedent is no more than 10 or 15 per cent in that difference. We're talking here about a disparity of around 63 per cent uh, in the example of Cumbria. So uh, there is no precedence in that, and there's, there's been no on, uh, on record uh, confirmation that they would be willing to make that type of racial change, this amendment would allow them uh, to do that. The idea that all every uh, island uh, uh, in Argyll and Butte, for example, uh, tomorrow will, will suddenly request to have a, their own councillor, well, they can do that today if they wanted. Uh, it's not going to change the process that they would have to go through either today or after this bill passes. What this does, however, is ensure that if uh, island uh, uh, councils did make representation to the Boundary Commission for an alteration that the Boundary Commission would have the ability to create these member wards. So nothing will deviate from existing due processes and practices. And I think the suggestion that, that these councils will suddenly want 23 extra councillors is, 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 is not, not the case at all. Um, I, I don't think it's worth spending a huge amount of time uh, reflecting on Kenny Gibson's uh, comments. I think to make cheap political points out of what is a very important bill, uh, I think doesn't, doesn't deserve, frankly, doesn't deserve any more of my time. But, but Mr. Gibson, Mr. Gibson might not think that the votes of Aaron and Cumbria are worth it, but we on these benches absolutely do. And that is why I ask members to support my amendment. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 29 be agreed to. Are we agreed? No. We're not agreed. We move to vote. Members may cast their votes now.
The result of the vote in Amendment Number 29 in the name of Jamie Green is yes, 51, no, 71. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 13 in the name of Lee MacArthur, already debated. Lee MacArthur to move or not move? Moved. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 13 be agreed to. Are we agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on Amendment Number 13 in the name of Lee MacArthur is yes, 62, no, 60. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I turn now to Group Number 9 and I call Amendment 14 in the name of the Minister in a group on its own and the Minister to move and speak to this amendment. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. The purpose of Amendment 14 is to amend the Marine Scotland Act 2010 to allow Scottish ministers to delegate regional marine planning to a single local authority in the three island Scottish marine regions of Orkney Island, Outer Hebrides and Shetland Isles in order to carry out the functions related to preparing a regional marine plan. As it stands at the moment, Section 12.2 of the Marine Scotland Act means that any council or public authority cannot have outright delegated authority on its own. There must be another person nominated by Scottish ministers. Marine Scotland has been working closely with Orkney Islands Council to consider the options for creating a partnership there and to try to address some of the issues the Council has had in finding a partner for the purpose of marine planning. The difficulties in Orkney were raised by the local authority in its written submission to this bill at stage one. Colin Smith lodged an amendment at stage two to try and address the issue and I thank him for doing so. I give a commitment then to liaise with him and come back with an appropriate amendment that address the technical requirements of this issue at stage three, and the result of that is Amendment 14. After discussion with him on what is quite a technical drafting exercise, I've, I've lodged uh, this amendment. It provides for the situation where, if there is difficulty in establishing a partner for marine planning for an island council in Orkney, Western Isles or Shetland Isles, it may be appropriate to allow for delegation to a council as a single entity. The amendment will not affect any of the other eight Scottish marine regions. Even if the local authority were to be delegated to a single entity, there is a legal requirement under Section 12.5 of the Marine Scotland Act that the ministerial direction on marine planning includes a statement of reasons for delegating to a public authority instead of a group. There's also a requirement for the public authority to consult with others and have regard to any representation made when, pre when preparing a regional marine plan. So while the local authority will take the lead in the regional marine pl plan, others will be able to have their say. I consider these measures to provide the remedy that is needed here, and I move Amendment 14 in my name. Thank you very much. I call Peter Chapman to be followed by Colin Smith. Peter Chapman. Very briefly, uh, Presiding Officer, we support Amendment 14 in the name of the Minister. We support the islands having greater authority and flexibility over their, over their marine licensing powers and the ability to allow regional marine plans. Can I call Colin Smith? Thank you, President Officer. As the Minister said, uh, Amendment 14, uh, in terms of use of name, concerns an issue I raised at stage two of the bill. And I thank the Minister for making good on his commitment to bring forward an amendment to this effect. Island authorities can often face particular challenges finding the required delegate partner for the delegation of marine planning functions, preventing these local authorities being granted these functions. This amendment provides an exemption allowing Orkney, Shetland and the Western Isles to carry out functions for reg regional marine planning as a single public authority if they are able to demonstrate difficulty finding a suitable partner. This reflects the unique problems these local authorities can have in this regard and ensures they're able to experience the benefits of delegating marine planning functions in spite of the barriers they face. This will improve efficiency and promote the integration of terrestrial and marine planning. It will therefore be no surprise to learn that I fully support this amendment. Thank you very much. And I call the Minister if he wishes to wind up. No. Uh, the question therefore is that Amendment 14 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And we turn to Group 10. I call Amendment 31 in the name of Jamie Green in a group on its own. And Jamie Green to speak to move Amendment 31.
Thank you, Mr. Officer. Very briefly, uh, this uh, amendment is about uh, report and operation of the Act. Um, it, the amendment says that ministers must prepare uh, a report on the operation of the Act, but more importantly, it must consult uh, the uh, island authorities listed in the schedule of this. I brought it at stage two, uh, perhaps with a slightly onerous timeline of one year, perhaps uh, uh, a little bit optimistic uh, in the introduction of a new bill, but after some discussion uh, uh, with uh, the Minister and his team, uh, I'm pleased to uh, be able to bring it back uh, that we, uh, with the intention that we review and report on this Act after four years. I think it's right that the next session of this Parliament uh, gives this Bill some scrutiny and the island authorities themselves can be involved in that scrutiny to make sure that this Bill uh, achieves uh, its intentions. Thank you very much. I call on the Minister. Simply just to say, President Officer, that I very much welcome this final amendment uh, in, this, uh, in this group. Uh, Jamie Green lodged an amendment at stage two to include a, a report on the Act, although his time scales were a little short, and I was happy to agree. Uh, in principles, we had very good uh, and useful discussions in, in the lead up to stage three, and so therefore Amendment 31 requires that four years after royal assent, Scottish ministers must publish and lay before Parliament a report on the operation of the Islands Act and must consult public authorities and others as appropriate in preparing uh, that report. I think that's a sensible proposal with a, uh, an eminently sensible timescale, and I'm happy to support Amendment 31. Thank you very much. Jamie Green to uh, wind up and to press a withdraw. Simply to uh, move. To press, yes. The question is that Amendment 31 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I call Amendment 15 in the name of the Minister, already debated, Minister, to move formally? Move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 15 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. I call Amendment 33 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated. Colin Smith, to move or not move? Uh, move. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 33 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes on Amendment 33 now. The result of the vote on Amendment 33 in the name of Colin Smith is yes, 56, no, 66. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 32 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated. Colin Smith, to move or not move? Uh, move. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 32 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. Move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on Amendment Number 32 in the name of Colin Smith is yes, 56, no, 66. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 16 in the name of Lee MacArthur, already debated, and Lee MacArthur to move or not move. Moved. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 16 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division. Members may cast their votes now. Amendment 16.
The result of the vote on Amendment Number 16 in the name of Liam MacArthur is yes, 62, no, 60. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I call Amendment 34 in the name of Colin Smith. Already debated. Colin Smith to move or not move? I move. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 34 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes consideration of the Island Scotland Bill at stage three. Now, before we move on to the debate, in fact, we'll have a short, short suspension, I have a, a determination to be made at this stage. As members will be aware, I am required under standing orders to decide whether or not, in my view, any provision of the bill relates to a protected subject matter, that is, whether or not it modifies the electoral system and franchise for Scottish parliamentary elections. In the case of this bill, in my view, no provision of the Ireland Scotland Bill relates to a protected subject matter, therefore it does not require a supermajority to be passed at stage three. So before we move on to the debate, uh, we'll just take a short suspension and we'll resume at 16.40. If we resume at 16.40, we'll have a six and a half minute suspension. Parliament suspended.
Uh, thank you. I think all relevant members are back in the chamber. So the next item of business is a debate on motion 12437 in the name of Hamza Youssef on the Island Scotland Bill at stage three. But before I invite Hamza Yusuf to open the debate, I call on the Cabinet Secretary for Rural Economy and Connectivity to signify Crown consent to the Bill. I call on Fergus Ewing, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. For the purposes of uh, Rule 911 of the Standing Orders, I advise the Parliament that Her Majesty, having been informed of the purport of the Island Scotland Bill, has consented to place her prerogative and interests insofar as they are affected by the Bill at the disposal of the Parliament for the purposes of the Bill. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. We now begin the debate. I invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now. I call on Hamza Yusuf to speak to and move the motion. Seven minutes, please, Mr Yusuf. Thank you, uh, Planning Officer. I'm delighted to open this afternoon's historic stage to the debate on the passing the Islands Scotland Bill. The final passage of the Bill represents an important milestone for Scotland's islands communities. The bill is unique, not just to this parliament, but also I think to any uh, parliament, marking the passage of one of the world's first and only place-based laws. I say one of the first, because David Stewart wouldn't forgive me if I didn't mention the Remote Islands Development Act in Japan. So it's one of the world's first and only place-based laws. And that is entirely fitting for our islands, which contribute so much to our culture, so much to our language, our landscape, our heritage, which has inspired poets, writers, songwriters, composers, artists, uh, which attracts visitors from near and, of course, from afar as well. They've contributed hugely to our past, to our present, and with this bill and other measures, we'll now have the opportunity, of course, to contribute even further to their own and our collective uh, futures. I've been the Transport and Islands Minister now for the best part of 24 months, for two years, and uh, travelling the islands, meeting island communities, I have to say, uh, is one of the best parts, if not the best part, uh, of the portfolio that I have. Uh, today's debate marks the culm culmination of a, a five-year uh, journey, uh, which at its end will see passed into law a series of measures designed to improve outcomes for Scotland's islands communities. And in those five years, uh, there are many people uh, to thank them. Less, I know Cabinet Secretary on my right has been involved uh, very much in this endeavour, as was his predecessor also. But uh, I think it's important for me to recognise those who have helped shape this journey. Back in 2013, the three island councils of Orkney, Shetland and the Western Isles seized the opportunity to push for greater recognition of Scotland's island communities with their bold Our Islands, Our Future campaign, which started us on this journey. I think it would be remiss of me not to put on record my thanks to the three leaders of the island councils at that time, Angus Campbell, Stephen Heddle uh, and Guy Robinson of, of Shetland Island. Uh, the three wise men, as I often uh, <laughs> call them and still would call them, I think, in fact, Angus Campbell and Stephen Heddle uh, might be in the gallery uh, today, so I would like to put my thanks yeah. to them yeah, and yeah. indeed for the constructive manner in which they brought this through and, and this bill is a culmination of their hard work and their efforts, not to say, of course, also the efforts of their successors who have also, uh, also engaged constructively uh, at the tail end of this process. And since then, this government has worked uh, as I say, constructive, constructively with those three councils, uh, and more recently with those of North Ayrshire, with Highland, uh, and indeed our Island Butte, to take forward our commitment to deliver an Islands Bill. I very much valued their advice, input and guidance, and look forward to it as we move into the Bill's implementation. So I also, of course, thank the committee and indeed other members, particularly those who represent Islands, either in whole or indeed part, uh, as well. Uh, in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of uh, the island communities, of course, the biggest thanks is, is reserved to them for those that have engaged with for those that have engaged with the process and given their thoughts uh, around the bill. In terms of the provisions uh, of uh, the bill, of course, there's a range of measures. I won't go through them uh, at all, uh, all of them at all, uh, Planning Officer. But I think it's important to mention one or two: the duty on Scottish ministers in the wider public sector on island proofing. That concept that we must take into account the needs and circumstances of island communities when in, in the decision-making process. That will bring uh, an island's awareness and island communities uh, and awareness of the needs of communities into the decision-making process into this parliament, but much wider uh, than that as well. I think the island's plan also is something that is being looked at extraordinarily carefully. We've already, of course, debated it during the amendments. It's, uh, you know, it's got a few high-level objectives already within the legislation, but much more room for conversation, consultation, discussion, engagement with island communities to see what else will uh, inform uh, that uh, national uh, islands plan. Uh, in terms of, uh, of course, uh, any plan that will require 
uh, support to deliver its key objectives. And over the last 11 years, this government has worked really hard to ensure that we're delivering for our island communities. For example, since 2007, we invested a billion pounds into our ferry services. We've close introduced RET, which has led to a boom yeah. on islands in the Clyde and Hebrides. We're going to be introducing uh, RET to the Northern Isles, uh, as I say, in the first half uh, of this year, as well as, of course, helping to support more recently in the recent budget uh, internal ferries for Orkney and Shetland. We've maintained the air discount scheme, increasing it in fact to 50%, uh, the maximum for the level of discount available. Established a rural and island housing fund worth £30 million. Uh, committed £600 million to the R100 programme, the biggest public investment ever made in UK broadband uh, project. And by the end of 2021, Scotland will be the only part of the UK where every single home and business can access super fast broadband. But, presiding officer, uh, one of the objectives of the National Islands Plan will be to improve and promote community empowerment. And we can start that now. I'm delighted to announce an award of £114,000 funding through the Scottish Land Fund for North Yale Development Council in Shetland to enable it to purchase two separate areas of land in Cullivaux. The Scottish Government fully supports the role of community ownership and bringing new employment, business startup, and tourism opportunities to the islands. Uh, when it comes to uh, islands, uh, islands uh, engagement as well, I'm delighted that we have uh, very good engagement with our islands communities through the islands ministerial group, again set up by my uh, colleague uh, on the right. Uh, and that engagement for me is, is hugely, uh, of course, important. Most recently, some of that engagement has centred around um, an, a potential islands deal. And the Scottish Government is, of course, committed uh, to 100% coverage of Scotland growth deals. Uh, and I know my colleagues are very much in continued dialogue with islands, local authorities uh, on that. In terms of next step moving forward and, and, and really to, to try to conclude, uh, planning officer, uh, today's debate marks the conclusion of the parliamentary process, but very much signals the start of some vital work that has to take uh, place following royal assent. I give our absolute assurance to all members across the chamber that communities will be an inherent part uh, of that and they will feel that this plan uh, that we have now uh, um, taken forward in this legislation, I hope, uh, will be their plan. Uh, and will be one that is uh, going to unlock the potential of island communities uh, right across uh, Scotland. Um, on my appointment as Minister for Transport and the Islands, uh, the First uh, Minister assured me that this job came with uh, great views, and it certainly does, but it also comes with great people as well. I've been tremendously fortunate in the last two years to have travelled to, to over 34 islands, in fact, I think, in, in Scotland, around Scotland. Yeah, yeah to meet with uh, island communities and hear from them the, the, the expectations uh, of this uh, bill. So, presiding officer, this bill, in conclusion, is not for government nor for parliament, nor even for the agencies who will play a key role. Uh, it is about people and it is for the people, those who have contributed to our island's heritage, those who contribute to their well-being uh, now and those who are yet to come, for whom this bill gives them and us all a strong platform in which to build a bright future for Scotland's islands. I therefore move that the Parliament agrees that the Island Scotland Bill be passed. Thank you, Minister. I call on Peter Chapman to open for the Conservatives. Mr Chapman, six minutes, please. I thank you, Presiding Officer. And I am pleased to open on behalf of the Conservative Group today. As with any stage of any bill, I think it is important to thank my fellow committee members, the clerks, the bill team, and every consultee and stakeholder we have worked with to get to this point. And in particular, we need, we need to remember that thanks needs to go to Orkney, Shetland and Western Isles councils who started the work to get us to this point back in 2013 with their uh, Our Islands, Our Future initiative. And I hope after today they are pleased with this bill and, and that it gives them the autonomy and the powers that they hoped for. I have reiterated at each stage of the bill that the enthusiasm and drive from the island communities has been fantastic and has been a driving force behind members of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee and everyone else involved in this bill to get it right. On our visits, it was very clear there is a community spirit and a willingness to work together and support each other, which is, a, it's, it's, it's inspiring to see but sadly is often lacking in some of our mainland communities. This bill is a positive step for the islands and we as a group support the bill, believing that it can make a difference to our island communities. A recommendation that was made at stage one, which I felt strongly about, was the concept of retrospective island impact assessment. As the term island proofing was used from the bill's early stages, it was clear expectations would be raised that this bill could significantly improve outcomes 
where islands had been heavily impacted by legislation designed for and focused on the mainland. Retrospective impact assessments would enable islands that have been significantly impacted by previous legislation to have this reviewed by Scottish ministers with the intention of mitigation. And although it was not my amendment, Yep, absolutely. Cabinet Secretary. To Mr Chapman for giving way, just looking prospectively rather than retrospectively, uh, could, could I ask Mr Chapman if the Scottish Conservatives still support the position that was expressed in a letter to Angus Campbell in his then capacity uh, as leader of council uh, that David Cameron supported the empowering of the islands to enable their renewable resources to be realized to the enormous benefit of their communities uh, by assisting the islands in respect of granting the necessary CFDs or other mechanisms to allow the island connections to take place. Mr Chapman, I'll give you your time back. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that. And I, we, we absolutely recognize on, on these benches the, the potential that there is on these islands for, for wind, uh, production. We absolutely recognise that. Um, and I was saying, although it was not my amendment that enabled this aspect to be added to the bill, I am pleased to see that Liam MacArthur's amendment did pass. And stage three has seen an improvement in the devolution of powers to local authorities. Island communities can sometimes feel disconnected from the mainland, but having this autonomy can make a big difference. And I am pleased to see amendments passed today that allow this. The main point of this bill was always to empower island communities, and this can now start on the islands through their own councils and authorities. And this will be something that we will be monitoring post-legislatively to ensure that island authorities are achieving the results intended by these amendments. Another area where I had concern at stages one and two of the bill was in regard to marine licensing. There was cross-party concern at stage one that existing Zetland legislation would be overruled by the Marine Development and Plans section of the bill and the dual licensing powers would not work on the ground. At stage two, I did attempt to safeguard these powers. However, at this stage, with Amendment 14 from the Minister, I am assured that the Zetland County Council Act is protected from unintended repeal, whilst the bill also retains provisions to enable continuity of existing development and enforcement. And I have had discussions with some of the councils that currently require marine licensing powers, and I am assured they are comfortable with the current powers they have, they have and the ability to increase future licensing powers. And I look forward to monitoring the progress the island authorities have with their marine development and any future marine licensing schemes that they may progress. And in closing, presiding officers, it is, it is clear that this bill, which has been fairly consensual since stage one, is even more so by the final process of stage three. This afternoon has seen amendments passed right across this chamber that help to strengthen this bill and ensure it can empower every aspect of the islands and their communities. It was a pleasure and a privilege to visit so many of our beautiful islands during the consultation process and hear the islanders' views on what this bill means to them and what their hopes for it are. I hope to hear that these views have come into fruition over the next years and beyond. And we as a group will continue to monitor all of the pressing matters we have discussed throughout this process and ensure that any snags and difficulties in its implementation are dealt with as soon as possible. Across this chamber in this afternoon's debate, there has been a tone of hope and expectation for what this bill will achieve for our island communities. Much of the change we want to see can be achieved by considering the needs of our islanders right at the start of all legislation. But it must also be recognised that much of the disadvantages faced by our island communities can only be addressed if there is the necessary money allocated to make things happen. I'm the members in his final, final words. Without that budgetary commitment, many of the aspirations contained within this bill will remain just that aspirations. Presiding officer, I sincerely hope that is not where we end up. Thank you very much. I call on Colin Smith to open for Labour. Mr Smith, please, five minutes. 
Thank you, President Officer. Labour shares the ambitions and aspirations of Scotland's proud island communities, communities that, that want to grow their population, protect their stunning natural beauty and environment, improve their infrastructure, both physical and digital, and tackle the scandal of fuel poverty. But to fulfil that potential, we need greater empowerment for those communities and more locally driven decision making. The Islands Bill is a positive step in that direction. Does it deliver everything we would want to see? No, of course it doesn't. Could it have been more radical by... I'm sure, it, I'm sure I'll take an intervention. For Cabinet the Secretary. Value, nothing else. When the Tories talk about cash, it triggers my intervention, and now Colin has uh, essentially triggered my intervention around population, because I think it's a fair point. Repopulating our islands is a key feature of the strategy that will be required for the economic sustainability for our islands. Uh, the member then goes on to talk about uh, empowerment and devolution to island communities, but is it not the case that to be able to deliver the population strategy for our country, we also require immigration to be involved to Scotland mm -hmm. so that we can repopulate the country and with it uh, our island communities? Uh, and on that case, I know that the island council leaders agree with me. Does the Labour Party? I'll give you time back and full names, please, in the chamber. Mr Smith. Uh, yes, I do. Uh, however, it's slightly above the remit of the, the Islands Bill before us today. Now, the Islands Bill is, however, a step forward. Uh, it could have been more radical. It could have given islands more powers. But there is much within this bill that we support. The proposals, for example, for the National Islands Plan has the potential to be transformative to develop local solutions to local challenges by putting the voices and priorities of island communities at the heart of policy making. Island impact assessments and a new statutory duty to have regard for island communities are also welcome. All too often, island communities are put at a disadvantage as a result of a, a one-size-fits-all approach to policy by many of our very centralised public bodies. The impact assessment process allows us to identify and mitigate any unintended consequences for island communities of those policies, strategies and services from those public bodies as well, within the, as, as, well as within the laws we make in this parliament. The changes to marine licensing and planning are also a positive step, recognising the importance of our marine environment to island economies and to communities. The new marine licensing powers in particular are an opportunity to empower local communities and the exemption passed today allowing island authorities to carry out delegated marine planning functions without a delegate partner addresses a long-standing problem for some of those authorities. The provisions on improved flexibility in electoral wards and the protection of the Western Isles constituency boundaries also improve representation for our island communities. But Labour does believe the bill could have gone further. We would have liked to have seen the bill devolve more powers to our island communities, really empowering those communities, putting local experience and expertise at the heart of decision making and in doing so, reversing the drift of centralisation we have seen in Scotland in recent years. More and more powers have rightly come to the Scottish Parliament from the UK Parliament, yet little has been done to devolve power from this Parliament to our local councils, including those of our island communities. However, as a result of amendments to the bill proposed and agreed today, and also at stage two to the bill, it is much stronger than it was at stage one. I'm especially pleased that today my amendments were successful to create a mechanism for island communities to request more powers and to enable and ensure the government must bring forward regulations to allow for a review mechanism on decisions assessing the impact of policies on island communities. Scottish Labour put forward positive proposals that have, in my view, strengthened this bill, as have the welcome amendments made by the government that adopt some of Labour's early proposals at stage two, along with amendments from other members right across the chamber, which have received real cross-party support. When it comes to the vote later, Labour will therefore support the bill, which I hope will receive unanimous support. The priority will then shift to ensuring the aims of the bill are realised. Many of its key provisions will rely on future work, most significantly the development of the National Islands Plan. We must aim to ensure that the development of that plan and likewise other guidance, regulations and schemes reflect not only the letter of the law, but the spirit of the bill that hopefully we will agree later today. I look forward to working with it, the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee and indeed colleagues across the chamber to ensure that the bill's aims are matched in its delivery. President officer, I also want to conclude by placing on record my thanks to those who have made this bill possible, and that is Scotland's island communities. The work of many of those communities on the Our Islands, Our Future campaign made clear there was a real need to better support and empower our islands. Our 93 islands may only represent 2% of the population of Scotland, but their value to our nation is truly immeasurable. Today, by hopefully passing Scotland's first ever islands bill, 
Parliament will take a small but important step forward in recognising and respecting those islands' value. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Smith. Now, Colin John Finney to open for the Green Party. Mr Finney, please. Um, Four minutes or thereabout. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. And I too would like to, to thank the various people who have contributed to us getting to this point. That's the, uh, our very uh, valued staff, uh, the witnesses who engaged. Uh, and indeed, I think this particular piece of legislation has been an example of excellent cross-party uh, work. We've heard um, from previous speakers about the, the uh, ministerial engagement on proposals at an earlier stage. And I think that is a good template for how we should be doing business. And I think it will turn out to be a historic piece of legislation. It is certainly the direction of travel that the Scottish Green Party want. We want to see more of it. Indeed, the principle of subsidiarity has been referred to, and that's what we want to see. But not powers for powers' sake, additional powers to uh, be used wisely, and they will be used wisely. And we'd, of course, like them to see them ultimately extended to greater tax-raising powers for local authorities, so that they're creating a greater proportion of uh, raising revenue for a greater proportion of their budget. Um, so this is all very welcome, and I have to say um, it, it created a lot of expectations, and whether these expectations have been realised, well, time will, alone will tell. But one of the groups that uh, uh, it will have raised expectations among is, is rural communities who are not associated with either of the three um, exclusively island authorities or the three mainland authorities with islands. And they were quite often referred to in our evidence, places like North West Sutherland, Ardermuck, and places like that, um, where many of the problems that we uh, discussed and hopefully have gone some way to addressing um, apply as well. Now, it, what, what's very clear is that there's no um, two islands the same, there's no two communities the same, and we often experienced um, when we did get out and about, and it was a great opportunity to get out and about, um, particularly for you Southerners who don't get up to the, the, the far north with any frequency. But we, we also found you get a group of people in a room, and as anywhere, you, you get a range of views. And I think we hopefully have embraced uh, the wide range that we are. There are op opportunities coming up, and our committee is also going to be looking at crofting legislation. And I think the wanting to sustain communities, and that's a, a much abused word, but in its real sense for what we really want to do, retain populations, have vibrant rural uh, communities. Some of the crofting legislation with regard to issues like new entrants, I think, is going to be uh, important. Um, UHI has shown the way with its collegiate system of delivering education to re retain our population. But as has been touched upon, immigration is something that is going to be an important uh, consideration for our islands going ahead. And I would just say, in the last session of Parliament, I, I represented the Wren Independent Green Group on the ministerial um, group, indeed chaired by the same minister, uh, Mr Youssef where there was cross-party consensus, including the Conservatives, about trying to reintroduce the, the post-visa, uh, um, the post-study uh, um, visa system. There was consensus, and it was the then Home Secretary, uh, Mrs May, who cowed the legs out of that. Now, we need to look at, at making um, our, 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 future, our islands truly um, sustainable. The retrospection aspect is something where there was a lot of expectations built. There was a number of amendments came here today, and as others said, I think the discussion around them showed that um, a proportionate uh, approach has been adopted. We don't all in life get what we want, and that applies to legislative amendments too. But I think that um, nothing about retrospection should take away the need that any organisation has with any policy or, uh, or process to be continually evaluating that. And if as we know some of them already have had a disproportionate impact on island communities, that should be being addressed as well. Now, um, in the very short time I have left, I think there was nothing summed up the, the situation better than the example of waste management that my colleague Tavish Scott bought in the prag uh, brought to the chamber and the pragmatic way that's been addressed. There will always be challenges. Hopefully this will go some way to addressing them. Many thanks. Thank you very much. And I call on Mike Rumbles to close the Liberal Democrats. Mr Rumbles, four minutes or thereabouts, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I first of all say that uh, after 14 years of lawmaking in the Scottish Parliament, this for me has been a very unusual bill process. <laughs> I am the Liberal Democrat lead on this bill, but I recognised at the outset uh, the particular interest and expertise of my two Liberal Democrat colleagues, Liam MacArthur, constituency MSP for the Orkney Islands, and Tavish Scott, constituency MSP for the Shetland Islands. Now, they have worked extremely hard on successful amendments to improve this bill. For their constituents in both Orkney and Shetland, and their constituents have been extremely well represented by them both, and they've taken some of the work 
from my shoulders, if I may say. However, when the bill was first published, I was worried about the, uh, ra raising the expectations of our islanders about the bill. And while the bill gives more powers to island councils and communities, it, it doesn't provide any extra funding or resources. And to be fair, the government, the didn't, government didn't set out to say that. Uh, it doesn't give it to the 66 public authorities for which this bill applies and are listed in the schedule. Now, on our committee visits to, uh, I went to Moland and to Orkney, when we spoke to islanders, I did feel that when they heard the bill was about island proofing, there was an expectation that funds would somehow be found to put things right. And I, from the finance minister, absolutely. Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, I thought that Mr Rumbles might take this intervention. I appreciate that he has. It, does the member recognise that it doesn't come with a new pot of money per se, but what the bill in its entirety and in negotiation with the, the leaders and communities can do is make sure that our public services are reconfigured to support island communities in the way that they've been asked to do. Mr. Rumbles. I do appreciate that point, but what I was reflecting was what the islanders were saying to us on the, on the committee. One of the other major concerns was that island proofing could be no more than a tick box activity by the 66 public authorities identified in the schedule. As the bill stood, there might have been, for instance, the ability for any one of the 66 authorities to have someone sit in an office somewhere, let's say, in the central belt and claim that they had indeed conducted a desktop impact assessment. This should not now be possible with the amendments we have passed today where consultation means real consultation. Um, there have been major improvements to this bill and we looked at the National Islands Plan in committee. We actually did feel that what was the purpose of the bill? Uh, islanders expected some uh, headline uh, activities and I'm pleased actually that the despite what was said earlier on that um, we've got things like increasing population levels what are the purposes environmental well-being improving transport services improving digital connectivity reducing fuel poverty ensuring effective management of the crown estate these are all really important issues and we've got them onto the face of the bill that's not to say others are excluded but MSPs came forward with these and felt they were really important and it reflected what people were saying to us. Um, on island proofing and community impact assessments and particularly requests for respective island communities impact assessments, retrospective ones, was really important. A scheme for requests by local authorities for the devolution of functions. These are real changes and real improvements. I am now convinced with the amendments passed today that this is a much improved bill and I'm not criticizing the government here, but it really does show the benefits of examination by the parliament, where the government doesn't automatically have a majority, and that's one of the really good things about the process that we have here. It can't just whip its MSPs to vote this thing through. There's genuine uh, attempts to improve the bill. And I can say, when, and an aside to the minister, when I said, how is he going to oppose one particular amendment? He said, oh, does that, we're opposing it. Does that mean you're going to support it? No, we've, we've always said at stage three, from our perspective, we're conscious we're making law here. And at stage three, particularly, we want to make sure that we get it right. I think we have got it right. Uh, it's a much improved bill. And it's a bill that I'm sure we can all support. Thank you very much, Mr. Rumbles. Open debate, call Stuart Stevenson, to be followed by Jamie Green, please. Mr. Stevenson. Uh, presiding officer, it's perhaps uh, no surprise that it should be the SNP who brought forward the Islands Bill because we are the only political party here, as far as I'm aware, who has previously owned an island. Uh, Aileen Moore McCormack, that was gifted to our then party leader in 1979. It's now put on a, a slightly different footing and there's a, a trust which is a registered charity uh, that looks after that island. I look forward to the new arrangements for electing councillors, uh, leading to one person living on uh, Aileen Moore McCormack, uh, electing themselves as a councillor uh, and serving accordingly for that island. Um, it, it's worth having a wee look back in the history of how some of the, the things happen. A hundred years ago, if you lived in Tarbot Harris, you were part of a council who had its headquarters in Inverness. And if you lived in Stornoway, you were part of a council that had its headquarters in Dingwall. 
because one was in uh, Inverness and the other was in Ross and Cromarty, which was the most idiosyncratic way of looking at things, notwithstanding the intense rivalry between the people of Harris and the people uh, of Lewis. In more modern times, um, when the postcodes were first introduced after a trial in Norwich in the early 1960s, the postcode for Stornoway was a PA postcode. In other words, it was a Paisley postcode because the first class mail was sorted in Paisley, not a, the second class mail, I beg your pardon, was sorted in Paisley. And of course, the aircraft came from an aerodrome, Glasgow, which was in Paisley to transport the mail up to Stornoway. Now we have a postcode that reflects the character and individuality of the area, HS. I've no idea where the HS comes from, but that's for uh, Hebrides. I've just had whispered <laughs> in my, my right ear. See, you can learn something every single uh, day. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that the debate has done is written uh, Tavish Scott's uh, obituary. It's something which I hope is not required for many years to come. Because when his obituary is published, it will have at the top of the page the man who saved Shetland from obscurity by getting the amendment that puts Shetland in its proper place in the cartographer's world. Now, it's not a trivial matter. It's not just an emotional matter. I remember in the early 70s at the Bank of Scotland, we were doing... Uh, an exercise, a modelling exercise, a mathematical modelling exercise to try and work out where a branch network should be. Amazing how some things come back again, isn't it? And we were looking at how lo far people might have to travel to different branches. And a company in London was doing the data prep. And when we did the first run of the model, the results look a bit odd because apparently Lerick branch should be getting customers from Elgin and the coast of the Murray Firth. And of course, such a gross error you could notice because they hadn't realised in London that Shetland wasn't in the Murray Firth and they had mapped it according to its being so. So there are practical effects uh, to some of the things uh, that we, 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 we see. Um, it's been uh, an interesting debate. Uh, my little contribution to the islands is uh, I was the privilege of being the minister who brought RET to the islands and other places. Although I gather it's not 100% popular, uh, but I haven't really met the people with whom it's unpopular. We now move, presiding officer, to get off the purple paper and onto the vellum. The parliamentary beehives will be working overtime to provide the beeswax which will create the seal on this excellent bill. I wish it bon speed and every success to our island communities. Thank you very much. I now call Jamie Green, followed by David Stewart. Mr Green, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I have no idea what will be the, on the obituary for Stuart Stevenson, but I, I dread... I, I really dread to think, uh, my members. Uh, I'm sure everyone in the chamber will uh, reflect on the, not just today's debate um, uh, and, and beeswax and, and maps, but also the process that we've gone through as a parliament uh, to get to where we are at stage three of this, this bill. I'd actually like to thank the uh, transport minister. It's probably not something I do very often from this side of the chamber, but uh, for bringing forward this bill uh, and, the, and, and for engaging with all members uh, from different parties on some of the amendments that we've had. It's been a, a very a constructive process. There are times we haven't always agreed on, on the wording of things or the, the concept behind things. I think we've got to a place where some very ex uh, excellent amendments have got through this afternoon, I think as the, the debate uh, showed us. Um, it, this was much more than just an academic exercise. It was very much about getting out there into the heart of islands. The minister went to a number of islands. I know uh, many of us as members, but also as committee members, e uh, equally went out and met uh, various communities and I think as, as John Finney says you put uh, a bunch of people in a room they'll all have different views and things and even within island communities they have different views on how things should be done a uh, point was raised earlier about the fact that some uh, people don't want more local authorities to have more power but they want because they see their local authorities as being uh, far away uh, and detracted from them equally as, as they do uh, of central government in Edinburgh. So, uh, you know, there are, there are lots of, uh, of things uh, to think about. It's not easy to, to produce a bill that, that will do uh, everything for all people. But if we look at where we got to from stage one to where we are, a number of things that we recommended as a committee have actually uh, uh, produced themselves in this final uh, uh, version of the bill on local empowerment and the devolution of powers. 
on the National Islands Plan and how it should be, and who, sh who, sh who it should be consulted with on measuring these plans and these outcomes and reviewing the Act, on putting islands at the heart of consultation, on the retrospective elements of uh, impact assessments. Uh, so I think there are a number of areas where we have actually made uh, progress. Um, I think the National Islands Plan really very much will be uh, the proof in the pudding of this. Uh, whilst there are some issues on the face of the bill, uh, I, I don't think that's quite uh, enough. I'm pleased that the Islands Plan will go through uh, an iterative process and will come to the Parliament uh, in due course, but I do hope that it is more than just words on paper. Uh, we did talk a lot about the concept of what island proofing is, and I think we decided as a committee that we're not really island proofing in this bill. The creation of island impact assessments is not the same as mitigating uh, the findings of those impact assessments. Impact assessments cannot just be bits of paper or box ticking exercises. They, they must uh, be genuine analysis of policy, of strategy, of, uh, of bills, of legislation, of decisions that are made both at this level but also at local authority level. They cannot just become uh, a piece of paper that says, yes, we thought about the islands and that's it, we've ticked that box, we'll move on. Uh, before the, uh, the, the finance minister is not here, but you know, this isn't about asking for more money always, it's about doing things in a different way. Um, I, I think despite our best efforts, things will not change overnight on island communities. You know, people there will still pay more for petrol than people on the mainland. They will still struggle to get hospital appointments due to the logistics of getting to mainland hospitals. They'll still struggle to fill professional posts and teaching and GPs, all the things that we talk about so much in this chamber. Uh, it won't magic our roads better. It won't make our beaches cleaner. It won't suddenly create housing overnight. Or indeed, will it create parity and access to our public services? But in the spirit of positivity today, this bill is a start. What it's done is it's forced us as MSPs, as policymakers, uh, as governments, to have a very public discussion about what our islands want and what they need. I hope that discussion turns into action. We should, at the heart of every decision that we make, think what effect will this decision have on our island communities. The fact that we're thinking that itself is progress, and I welcome this bill as a result. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call David Stewart, be followed by John Mason. Mr Mason will be the last speaker in the open debate. Mr Stewart, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and as a Highlands and Islands member, I strongly support any and every political initiative to support, grow and develop our island communities. I welcome today's debate and I want to thank the Minister, my MSP colleagues and the councils, particularly of Orkney, Shetland and Western Isles, uh, for their tireless work on this endeavour and I welcome them uh, today to the gallery. Of course, there's uh, nothing new in the argument at home and abroad. Uh, about strengthening our island uh, communities. And of course, the Minister would expect me to mention the 2016 Japanese Act for Remote Islands, which was passed a couple of years ago. But if we go back in time, we had the Montgomery Committee, which reported in April 1984, which recommended consolidating, developing, and extending the powers uh, of island councils. Other, mention, other members have mentioned the key elements of the Treaty of the European Union, the key principle is subsidiarity, taking decisions in a localised and decentralised way. And of course, the European Union has always had a strong and consistent policies to give special attention to the specific characteristics of territories with serious and permanent handicaps, including islands. That's why, obviously, the development of structural funds were so important for island communities. Now, these handicaps are well known to islanders, limited and costly modes of transport, restricted and declining economic activities, and the fragility of markets and loss of young people. However, some things have not changed. And at a conference I mentioned, I think at stage two, that was organized by the Shetland Islands Council and the Committee of the Regions, the 2011 Euro Island study was looked at. Now this analyzed island communities across the EU and it was debated and discussed. And they looked at common characteristics across the 28 nations, that by and large islands have below average connectivity, their GDP is below the European average, economic convergence is slower, the number of job and career opportunities are low and services are of variable quality and high cost. But there has to be a counterweight presiding officer and that was the 2012 Geospec survey which also concluded that the islands have close-knit communities, they've got high value natural capital and the potential for renewable energies. It's also noted that islands experienced higher vulnerability to climate change through heightening sea levels and increasing light loaded storms. So all this comes together to mean that policies and laws affect island communities in a way they don't affect anywhere else. 
while they have some similarities with rural regions in general, the specificity and preferality of islands marks them as different. Because of that, it's important that we are not territorial blind, to use the words of the EU's Global Europe 2050 vision. Now, while much of this bill is to be celebrated, it has very good attentions, it's very high level, and leaves much of the detail to be set out in regulations, but also makes it hard to determine what the work in practice uh, will look at. But as the Western Isles Council have argued in a letter to me, the acid test will be strong and effective island proofing that will be the mark of the success of the bill as well as the future of our island communities. How and when will an island's impact assessment be required? Real devolution means additional powers to the island communities. Will this happen with the bill? New powers need financial muscle. Real devolution means resource-based control, transferring control of the seabed from the Crown Estate to island authorities and perhaps onward to community land and harbour trusts. And new powers need strategic decision-making in the planning, designing and commissioning of mainland ferry services and the, rec and the recognition yeah, I've just finished the sentence, and the recognition of island status in the Scottish okay. constitutional setup. Briefly, Cap, uh, Minister. Well, well, I agree with what the member is saying. Does he recognise that the Islands Bill is part of a suite of measures taking into account the Crown Estate measures that we're taking forward, the community empowerment measures we've always taken forward, and indeed now the National Islands Plan, which will come forward as part of this bill? Mr Stewart. And I agree with the point the Minister's made. But also, in the final few seconds, um, President Officer, real devolution means public sector job relocation, as John McConnell did when he moved SNH headquarters from Edinburgh to Inverness. How about the Calmac HQ to Western Isles, Crown Estates HQ to Orkney, or the Land Commission HQ to Shetland? What about single public authority status for Health Board, Local Authority, and High? under one umbrella in each island authority. Now, I celebrate, I'm in the last minute. No, no, member must I'm, close. I celebrate this legislation to be brought forward, acknowledging the different and varying needs of island communities. A journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step. This bill is a first step and to be welcomed. And to finish with the words of Solomon McLean, my tale is of the ethos of our island's ebbs. Our islands have been ebbing for too long. Now is the time to change that tale. Glad you managed to get that in, Mr. Stewart. Uh, I now call John Mason, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I'm delighted that we have got to this stage three with this bill, uh, which has to be one of the most enjoyable bills, as well as, of course, as being very important and very useful, uh, that I have been involved in. To be able to visit a number of Scotland's fabulous islands with the REC Committee and count it as work was absolutely great. And when we visited Mull, I took the chance to pop over to Ulva. So I think there is something symbolic about the fact that the community buyout of that island has moved ahead so far, even as the Islands Bill has made its way through Parliament. Islands are a key part of Scotland's history and geography, so I believe we all as a nation have a responsibility for them, for their communities, and for their general well-being. Despite representing a city constituency, many of my constituents would have connections with the islands, such as families having come from there or relatives who still live there. So I do not see this bill as some kind of minority interest. Rather, it is of national interest and makes it clear that Scotland's islands must be in the mainstream of our thinking, particularly here in the Scottish Parliament. We spent a lot of time in the committee considering topics including what should be in the bill itself and what should be in the islands plan. And within that, the question of what should be in the bill about the islands plan and its contents. There was clearly a temptation to put more on the face of the bill, and I think there has been movement on that point, and we have reached a reasonable position. Then again, the question of island impact assessments have been the subject of much discussion and debate. The term island proofing has been used as well, and my concern has been that that term might suggest we could make life on the islands exactly the same as life on the mainland of Scotland. However, that can clearly never be the case. When you are living on a piece of land surrounded by water and you cannot get on and off 24 hours each day, yes, there is something different. Now, it's true that Ardnamurchan and other parts of the mainland can be extremely remote and residents face similar challenges to those living on the islands. However, I remain convinced that islands are uniquely different and it is not only justified but necessary to have legislation specifically for islands as we hope to pass today. I do not believe we can island-proof in the sense that we can waterproof something, but I do believe that island impact assessments 
can make various public authorities, including ourselves in Parliament, think more carefully and consider more often what, impact our, what the impact of our actions and decisions might be for islands. When the committee visited various islands, the subject of ferries was always high in the agenda. And just this morning, we had Carl Mack at the REC committee to discuss capacity, RET, and a host of related matters. So the committee is well aware that ferries are central to island life, but we can expect topics like that to appear in the National Islands Plan rather than in the bill itself. I'm particularly pleased that an amendment passed at stage two, which included uninhabited islands in the bill. Just because no one lives permanently on a particular island today does not mean that will continue to be the case. And even if no human being lives in an island at all, it can still be vitally important for birds and other wildlife. In this regard, I'm particularly grateful to RSPB for their commitment and assistance in framing amendments around national heritage, environmental well-being, etc. Presenting officer, now that we've got the ball rolling more seriously for Scotland's islands, I am planning to spend my summer holiday visiting some of England's islands, and I will maybe report back on that as to how they are doing. However, for now, I commend this bill to Parliament and very much hope it will pass at decision time. Thank you. Thank you very much. And our closing speech is I call on Rhoda Grant. Up to five minutes, please, Ms Grant. Thank you, presiding officer. Firstly, I must thank the councils and communities who work to shape this bill. The bill needs to empower rather than protect. Protecting assumes that the Scottish Government knows best, and this is seldom the case. The people on the ground know best. They need to be empowered to make decisions that affect their future. And that was the vision of the three islands councils when they brought forward Our Islands, Our Future. We have strengthened the bill, but much work still needs to be done around the islands plan if it's going to meet expectations. Colin Smith um, said in his remarks that the bill could have gone further, and of course that's true. But he, in his Amendment 27 and a similar amendment from Liam MacArthur, actually allows Scottish Government powers to be devolved to island authorities. And this allows islands to make decisions um, that suit their needs, because too often we've seen that islands are handed down policies and targets that run contrary to their needs. David Stewart said powers need to also come with resources, and I think this is very much the case. If those powers are to be devolved, also the resources that make them happen need to be devolved. And it allows then those policies to make a genuine difference to our island communities. There was also amendments on retrospection passed today, which I think are very, very important to the legislation. I don't think every law should be reviewed to see how it it works with regard to islands, but there are, there are policies and there are, is legislation in place that actually damages our island communities. And we've seen recently with Highlands and Islands Airports Limited, a wholly owned Scottish Government company, looking to centralise their air traffic control. And that could move these jobs out of islands and indeed out of the highlands and islands altogether. And that would be a retrograde step. So hopefully this uh, policy, th these amendments with regard to retrospection will make highlands and islands airports limited. Look again at what they're doing. And also, as Colin Smith said, other government bodies and indeed um, arm's length authorities to look at their centralising policies which have damaged islands by removing jobs from the communities that very much need them. Because we need to strengthen those communities and we need to build them. And therefore the amendment with regard to depopulation I believe is crucial because this will be the real barometer of success of this act. Whether the populations of our islands grow and they become much more um, sustainable Yes, we need more people in the whole of Scotland, but the need is much more urgent in our island communities. People will come back, people really want to come back, and others want to relocate for a better quality of life. But there has to be jobs and there has to be opportunities to allow them to come back. David Stewart said fragile communities uh, lead to the loss of young people, and we've seen that throughout our island communities for many years. We need to stop and then we need to reverse this trend to make our islands grow. And this bill has the potential um, to do that if the, if the National Islands Plan is, is right. Because as Jamie Green said, 
the plan will be the proof of the pudding. Much of the powers within this Act will be contained in the plan. So how it is brought forward is crucial. There should be very clear outcomes and targets and measurable indicators to track the performance of this so we can see if it's actually working. And the committee must also be able to scrutinise the plan, look at the annual reports and the like, and to have an input from stakeholders to make sure it's working, because this really will make the difference to our island communities if it works right. Presiding officer, the bill has shown how the parliamentary process can improve legislation. The original bill was timid, and um, it, while we know it could have gone further, the finished article is much stronger. And that's a tribute to Colin Smith, my colleague, who put a lot of work into this, and also to the communities and the councils who worked to alongside us to strengthen the bill, especially the three island councils for starting the process in the first place with Our Islands, Our Future. Hopefully, through this bill, they will have a greater say in that future. Thank you very much. And I call on Donald Cameron to close the Conservatives. The General six minutes, Mr Cameron. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And um, at the outset, I should note that the Scottish Conservatives have always welcomed the Islands Bill, and we are pleased to add our support at stage three. And from a personal perspective, as a Highlands and Islands MSP, I'm under no illusion how important this legislation is to the communities which I represent, and I hope their expectations are fulfilled. And in a way, I think one of the most important amendments was actually one of the final ones, which was the one um, that Jamie Green introduced and was supported by the minister, which is the report, because I think the four-year report is actually going to be a fundamental aspect of how, how well this, this, this bill or this act, hopefully, um, is performing and whether it is indeed um, empowering communities that we've spoken so much about. So I'm very pleased to see um, the consensus around that amendment. Um, it is perhaps sad that this um, Islands Bill um, has always been an enabling bill, first and foremost, when it, when it could have done more. But to be fair to the government, uh, they've always been clear that that would be the case. And an enabling bill it is, and we accept that. It has, as many have mentioned, I think, been strengthened considerably at stages two and three, and if it hadn't been uh, amended, I think it would have fallen short of um, our island's expectations. Um, I, I spoke in the stage one debate, um, but then I felt slightly removed from the process because I'm not on the uh, REC committee, and it, it's um, with great pleasure to return to it now in, in its final version, and it is much improved. And I would also um, join Jamie Green commending the minister personally uh, for his engagement. Um, even at the very start, I recall a meeting with him and other members of my party uh, before the bill um, um, was, sort of, was publicised, and, and he has um, engaged throughout this process. And I'm also glad that other opposition party members have helped to strengthen the bill, to unlock its true potential, and to deliver what campaigners have called for, which is an island's bill that might truly empower uh, island communities. And I think the phrase tick box exercise has become overused, but um, the essential point uh, remains. It, it, um, it must achieve tangible, meaningful change rather than... Yes, indeed. Cabinet Secretary. I'm grateful to Mr Cameron for giving way. And would, would he confirm to me that one substantial way of empowering the Highland communities would be by campaigning with all other parties to unleash the potential of their renewable energy uh, and support the... Uh, connection to the islands to enable that uh, and earlier Mr Chapman said that he, he recognized the potential but he stopped short of actually committing the Scottish Conservatives to continuing to support these projects and I'd be most grateful if uh, Mr Cameron could now confirm that the stories still do support that as did David Cameron. Uh, you were going to get your time back, Mr. Cameron. Don't look agitated. Thank you. Yes, I don't want to Mr. get Cameron. confused that Mr. Cameron's being mentioned. But um, I, I do, we, we do fully support um, renewable energy on the islands. And I would point um, the Cabinet Secretary to our manifesto commitment in the general election last year, where we made an explicit commitment to remote island wind, uh, which has now been honoured and is allowing projects across the Western Isles to get into um, uh, the auction in 2019. So, so we. we um, we have put our money where our mouth is, Cabinet Secretary. Um, to continue, um, it is the islands who must take credit for campaigning tirelessly for an islands bill, especially the local authorities, and they've been mentioned, I'd like to mention them by, by name, the Western Isles, Orkney, Shetland, 
Argyll and Bute and Highland Council and North Ayrshire. And as others have spoken um, about five years ago, Scotland's three um, sort of island councils, if I could call them that, started Our Islands, Our Future. Um, and they were soon joined by other councils with islands and indeed smaller communities. And together they have lobbied and lobbied until it was accepted that change was needed. And I first came across Our Islands, Our Future when I was a candidate in Auckland and Shetland in the 2015 election, three years ago. And even then, there was a huge amount of excitement uh, around the campaign. And it's um, one of the great pleasures has been to witness it building um, momentum. Because for too long, uh, presiding officer, this parliament has felt too remote to islanders. And with this bill, islanders can no longer be ignored. Their voices will now be heard, and that is vital. And it is refreshing to see, for once, the government looking to enable devolution of power away from the centre rather than the other way around. And I've said before, um, one of the great aspects of being a Highlands and Islands MSP is the ability to uh, visit um, the islands across, uh, across uh, the Highlands and Islands. Um, and last Friday, I was on Butte, um, and um, it was a wonderful day. But it was quite interesting talking to people there. Simply being on an island does not necessarily mean that you are treated exceptionally. And hopefully, this bill will change that. And as others have spoken about in debates before, I think we have to be very careful about how we characterize islanders or island communities. Um, others have mentioned that those who live in remote areas of the mainland, um, which are very like islands, but not technically islands, um, deserve to be kept in mind uh, going forward. So in conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, this bill must be the start and not the end of empowering island communities. And as uh, Rhoda Grant and Jamie Green both spoke about, the, the, the National Islands Plan will be critical in, in that regard. And those on the islands are watching carefully. They want the practical devolution of power. They do feel remote and ignored or dealt with inflexibly. And if this truly is an enabling bill, then it has to be the catalyst for further change. It also has to be set in a wider context. I think the minister realized this. He spoke of a suite of measures. It has to be set in a wider context of islands with issues uh, relating to transport, um, the tourist industry, infrastructure, the devolution of the Crown Estate, uh, to mention just a few things. But finally, uh, presiding officer, this bill must not be empty words, but must affect real change to the benefits of all on our islands. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call on Hamza Yusuf to close the debate for the government. Uh, Minister, um, seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. I want to thank everyone who's contributed to this afternoon's debate. It's been an excellent debate. I've uh, really applauded every single contribution, I think, in, uh, in this chamber, uh, as I have uh, today. Uh, Stuart Stevenson did threaten to take us down to a dark place when he started talking about Stuart uh, Tavish Scott's obituary uh, at one point, but I'm pleased that we've managed to get it into this debate into a much, much more uh, positive uh, place. I think I want to try to address a few of the points, some common themes coming out from everybody's contribution. I'm really also, I want to join the chorus uh, of other members who have said that the process and the parliamentary process, I think, has been uh, a really great example of how we should do legislation, uh, undoubtedly, uh, in this uh, parliament. There's been really good constructive ideas coming from right across the chamber. I'm delighted uh, many of them have made it uh, into the island's uh, bill, which we'll hopefully be passing in just a few moment's time. So I think the constructive nature of that, and I thank all members who've been involved uh, in that uh, process. Uh, in terms of uh, where we've come to in, in, in the last five years, I just want to make the point, this is a journey, this is the culmination uh, of a part of the journey uh, very much that, that we're on. And, uh, you know, I would just say to, to, to Colin Smith uh, and others who made this point that, uh, you know, it is this Scottish Government I'm very proud to be a part of that brought forward the Lerwick Declaration, that brought forward the prospectus uh, for our islands, that has now brought forward this islands bill that no other government and administration previously had. We're taking forward community empowerment legislation and have brought that forward and, of course, the Crown Estate legislation uh, as well. So this is, uh, as Donald Cameron has just uh, reiterated, a part of a suite of measures that are going to empower uh, our island local authorities and I'm unashamed, uh, I'm really proud in fact to be part of a government that has delivered that suite uh, of measures and I hope many, many more measures uh, indeed to come to help empower our island uh, communities. I thought John Finney made a really good point around uh, the diversity that exists uh, in our islands. I think all of us, including myself at times, have been 
guilty of talking about our islands as one homogenous block. They are not. Anybody that has travelled uh, to our islands will know the differences uh, amongst those islands. In fact, amongst neighbouring islands, whether it's Yell, uh, Yell and Unster, whether it's uh, Westry, Papa Westry, whether it's uh, North Youth, South Youth, those rivalries that sometimes exist, but those cultural differences that exist in islands that literally uh, neighbour uh, each other. So John Finney was right to make that point about the diversity. And the Islands Bill and the National Islands Plan must make sure it reflects that diversity within the measures uh, that uh, do come forward. Um, we uh, are delighted, as I say, with the, the, the measures uh, in this bill. I think some important measures have been taken uh, forward. Clearly, the pro concept of island proofing uh, will undoubtedly be watched closely uh, by members, by local authorities, by communities. And I thought Mike Rumble's point on this was a very good one. I think island communities have an expectation of what this bill will deliver. So uh, what it has on the paper is one thing. What it will practically and pragmatically deliver, our island communities will be watching with great interest. And island proofing, I'm sure, will be tested very early on uh, once this bill uh, is given uh, royal uh, assent. Um, key, uh, other key me measures uh, as well, I want to thank Tavi Scott, the, the Shetland Isles, Islands, can now be assured that no public authority gets to put them in a box on a map in the future. But I think, although we sometimes spoke about it, I mean, it's a serious issue, but I think sometimes it's been spoken about, uh, perhaps even in the media, a little bit flippantly, it goes to a really, really serious issue around how we perceive our island communities. Uh, people might have thought when they put them in a box next to, to Murray or, or the Aberdeen, uh, coast in Aberdeen, that uh, actually the island communities out there don't matter, that we can just move them, shift them, do what we want with them. Well, actually, we're sending a very clear message that that cannot be done, should not be done, because we value our island communities just as much as we value uh, our mainland uh, communities. And I think that's a really important point uh, to have uh, raised. Um, in terms of uh, uh, Rhoda Grant's contribution, if I can just, again, gently say to, to, to Rhoda Grant, um, you know, we have delivered uh, to our island communities, have empowered our island uh, community. I've talked about the Crown Estate measures we're taking forward. I've talked about the community empowerment legislation that we brought forward. I would also say, as her colleague uh, just sitting behind her, Jackie Bailey, who often asks me to centralise and take ownership of the Gurukul Kilcreggan ferry. So, of course, there are times when local authorities will ask us to take uh, those powers to the centre. And, of course, I'm happy to have that discussion and conversation with them. Of course, I give way. Jackie, Jackie Bailey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. On the basis that the Minister mentioned the most important ferry service in Scotland, which of course is Kilcreggan to Gorrit, can I ask him when is he going to take this over? Minister. Uh, of course, those constructive discussions with SPT uh, are continuing, and of course, in uh, principle, uh, I will look at those, that request uh, very, very favourably. But that would be, of course, an example of centralisation that she is asking me. Uh, to take uh, forward. But I just put that point gently because it's been a very constructive debate, a very, very good debate. And I just want to end, presiding officer, by saying that, uh, you know, I think I have certainly learned from my travels to 34 uh, islands across Scotland that uh, they play a huge role in our lives collectively as a nation. There's people that have fought to keep that island's heritage very much alive, men like John McCormick, Ian Crichton-Smith, Solly McLean, George Mackay-Brown, women uh, like uh, Naomi uh, Mitchison, Ishbel McCaskill, Mary Vaughan Norrin, which uh, of course translates, yeah. if you don't speak Gaelic, Big Mary of the stories. So there's a rich theme also of modern island writers and works to draw on as uh, well. Kevin McNeil, Peter May, Anne Cleves, uh, Amy Liptrot, uh, amazing, amazing musicians which many of us will have heard of. Uh, of course, Kappa Cayley, Stornoway, Ali Bain, Blazing Fiddles. In fact, almost every day, every year, there's a new generation, I think a whole new generation of uh, talent uh, appearing. We have the majesty of uh, Peter Maxwell Davies' work inspired by the life uh, that he made on Orkney, the traditional, the modern, melded in music and cultural festivals on Shetland, the Hebrides, and indeed on Millport uh, as well. And then, of course, and I maybe should be wary about talking this 14 days into Ramadan, but the great taste of our islands as well, the taste of Arran, the distilleries of Isla and Jura, the seafood of Mull, uh, the black pudding of Stornoway, food and drink on our islands is absolutely flourishing. Don't miss out, and then there is, uh, of course, the diversity on our islands uh, as well. We've spoken about the diversity of our islands uh, from one neighbouring island to the next, uh, but also the diversity of our islands have changed uh, in terms of the de demographics as well. I was delighted, in fact, this month that uh, Stornoway became the, the place where we have the first ever islands mosque 
uh, open just in time uh, for Ramadan. I don't think I'll be going to Stornoway for Ramadan because I think sunset will be quite a bit later uh, than it is where I am uh, on the mainland. But I'll certainly uh, intend to visit uh, sometime uh, in the future. Uh, Presiding officer, I'm delighted that we have passed this historic Islands uh, Bill, which I hope we will vote for shortly, uh, unanimously, in a cross-party fashion. Uh, during that time, I'm not ashamed at all to admit that I've learned a lot uh, about Scotland's islands, about a fundamental part, I think, of Scotland's soul, which uh, hitherto was hidden uh, from me. Having visited many of our islands, I have a much better understanding of who they are, but also consequently who, who all of us are and why our islands matter, why they, uh, what they mean to all of us. And to quote uh, Andrew Gregg from his poem about Orkney, this life, it is the way you lean to me and the way I lean to you as if we are each other's prevailing. And that sense of pre prevailing is very deep rooted, uh, is vital, and I'm confident this bill we passed today will help our islands and the communities not just to prevail, but hopefully to thrive. <laughs> Thank you very much. And that concludes our stage three debate on the Ireland Scotland Bill. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 12484 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Bureau setting out a business programme. If anyone objects, please say so now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move the motion. Moved. Thank you very much. No one objects. The question, therefore, is that motion 12484 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. <clears throat> and there's one question to be put as a result of today's business. And because it's legislation at stage three, we will hold a division. The question is that motion 12437, in the name of Hamza Youssef, on the Island Scotland Bill at stage three be agreed, and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 12437 in the name of Hamza Youssef is yes 122, no 0, abstain 0. The motion is agreed and unanimously and therefore the Islands Scotland Bill is passed. Now that concludes decision time. We'll move on to members' business in the name of Joan McAlpine, but we'll just take a few moments to clear the chamber uh, of some members and for ministers to change their seats.